Hi everyone, um, we are back. Who's ready? Not me, I'm not ready. This is part two to a video that I made back in March. Um, I pretty much took a gamble and made a two and a half hour long video recapping season one of the ABC, which would, people corrected me in the comments, ABC slash reruns on ABC Family hit television show Once Upon a Time. Um, and I say I took a gamble because I did not have an audience before that video and um, I didn't really know what I was doing and I was just doing it for fun. And wow, it found an audience. That's, if you watch that video, if it came up in your feed and you commented and you liked it and you shared it, thank you so much. I never thought I'd be able to be the person that's like, oh, I love reading all your comments, but I really do. You guys are so funny. You make me laugh out loud. I don't even know what to do with all of the love and support that video got. Um, yeah, who is ready for season two? We've got the board behind me. Um, I think we're ready to rock and roll. If you like this video, I don't have a funnier way of asking you to comment the way I did last video because I might be getting but if you still want to comment, despite that, feel free. All right, let's get into season two of Once Upon a Time. So here, here is our board from last, last March. Some things are a little different. Some of the pictures I have changed just to make visual user experience better. The pink washi tape has kind of always meant romantic relations between characters. Or the blue washi tape is now purple because I just ran out of blue washi tape. So purple washi tape means um, familial relations. And it kind of makes sense. Like that's the mother, that's the father, kind of things like that. If, yeah, yes, no, maybe so. Now remember how we had congruent timelines last video. There was, um, I guess they weren't technically congruent, but there were two parallel timelines always. There was the Storybrooke timeline, which was the here and the now and what's going on in our real world. And there was the Enchanted Forest timeline that took place before the Storybrooke curse, um, about 28 years ago before Regina kind of set the curse on all of the um, fictional fairy tale characters. It gets a little more dicey this season. We generally have three timelines, but I will elaborate on them later. They'll make a little bit more sense. Um, but for now, we have Storybrooke and the Enchanted Forest. All right, here we go. Season two, episode one, Broken. We zoom in on this man right here. You can tell he's important because he's gonna be really big and kind of go right in the center. We are in Boston. We follow this man to his apartment where it is raining, kind of getting ready to storm, and he tries to close the window, but it's kind of a not great apartment, so he can't quite get the window closed. And as he's trying to get this window closed, a dove flies in carrying a postcard. The postcard has one word written on it, broken. He flips it over and sees that this postcard is from Storybrooke, Maine. In the Enchanted Forest, we zoom in on two guys riding like hell. They are riding like hell to save Princess Aurora. The first man is another white boy prince, but he did, he did get a face this time just because I think he's a little more important than the one-off Prince Charming we never saw again. Um, he is Prince Philip. Look at him go. The other man isn't actually a man at all. She is Famulan of China. So we have our three new characters, Princess Aurora, who is under a sleeping curse, Prince Philip, who wants to wake her up from the sleeping curse, and Mulan, who is helping out her buddy, Prince Philip. So Philip, riding like hell, runs into this kind of castle, this dilapidated building where Aurora is under the sleeping curse and he gives her the kiss of true love. And she wakes up. Aurora wakes up and she kind of notices that she's in this dilapidated establishment <laughs> that was once a kingdom or a castle. And she asks what's going on. And Philip's like, 
It's like, it's okay, don't worry, our people have gathered in a safe haven. Back in Storybrook, remember the purple smoke that enveloped everyone at the end of the last season and kind of nobody knew what it was? Well, at the moment, it's not too bad because it swirls around them, but then it goes away. Everyone reunites because they remember who they are. So Snow and Charming remember who they are. They see the dwarves again. They see Ruby and Granny and everyone realizes that they are their real storybook characters. <laughs> um, everyone seems quite happy except for Emma. Emma's reunited with her parents after a lifetime of being an orphan, but suddenly her parents are the same age as her. They're Snow White and Prince Charming of Disney fame. She's realizing everything is true, as we know, but it's a lot for one person, especially one person who grew up without parents. So everyone is confused as to why they are still in Storybrooke, because they thought that if the curse was broken, they would have been swept back to the Enchanted Forest. But that's not what happened. Lots of townspeople, led by Dr. Whale right here, form a mob um, to go after Regina, because remember, they know that she's the evil queen now, and they didn't even like her in the first place, but now they hate her. Um, Archie, who remember is Jiminy Cricket, is the only one who's like, hold on, <laughs> killing doesn't solve anything. But the only reason the mob stops is because they realize that Regina might actually have her magic back if the curse is broken, um, and they're not about to get, you know, killed by the evil queen. However, some of them still do, and they realize she doesn't actually have magic, um, and she can't exactly defend herself. So they realize she has no powers, and they end up locking her up in the sheriff's station. Meanwhile, Belle reveals to Gold that she was locked up by Regina for 28 years before and during the curse, but she makes Gold promise not to hurt Regina in revenge. Gold agrees, but when he goes back to his shop, he's clearly doing something very nefarious, and he takes out a very plastic-looking gold medallion. We'll put that right there for now. Back in the Enchanted Forest, well, um, oh, they need a little, oh, they need a little pink tape. Meanwhile, back in the Enchanted Forest, these two are having their little reunion of true love, but Mulan notices something, and a ghost-like wraith appears to attack them. Philip manages to cut off its gold medallion, which is kind of what gives it its power. And Mulan reveals that this wraith is pretty much a dementor, like it'll suck out your soul if you get marked by this medallion. They think no one got marked by the medallion in the scuffle, but turns out Philip did. I really could use two medallions right now, but I only printed out once. This one's gonna play a little bit of ping pong. So in the night, Philip leaves, because if you're marked by the wraith, it's gonna come back and attack you, and he wants to keep these two safe. So he leaves in the night. Gold visits Regina in jail, and he brands her with this medallion so that the wraith will come after her. Um, he then summons the wraith to Storybrook using his Dark One powers, because remember, he is the one that brought magic back to Storybrooke with this bottle. That's what caused the purple smoke. For some reason, Regina doesn't have her powers, but he does because, you know, he's always playing the long game. He's always three steps ahead. Emma goes to confront Gold because, remember, he double-crossed her because he wanted to bring magic back to Storybrooke with this magic bottle. He reveals he did bring magic back, but he won't tell her why. Um, they're interrupted by the Wraith, which is a very interrupting force, I would say. And he says, oh, that wraith is going to take care of Regina. That wraith is going to kill Regina. Belle had been listening in on this conversation the entire time. She feels betrayed because he lied to her. Are we surprised? No. And so she leaves the shop. Get ready for six more seasons of that shit show because we're just getting started. The wraith finds Regina and attempts to suck out her soul, original. Um, luckily, Snow White beats it with fire and it flies away to regenerate or whatever. Meanwhile, Henry has asked Emma to protect Regina because remember everyone hates Regina because she's the evil queen, but Regina is still Henry's mom and he still loves her, um, which means they have to kill the wraith, which apparently, yeah, it flew away to regenerate, but it's not dead is kind of the shtick. Um, so Regina gets out Jefferson's hat box. Also, I never fully 
fully was present to the fact that Jefferson is played by Sebastian Stan, who is James Buchanan Barnes, aka the Winter Soldier. I just didn't mention it last video, and I just feel like we need to be fully present to that fact, that we are seeing this man in his prime before he joined the Marvel Cinematic Universe. He was in the Storybrooke Cinematic Universe. So she gets the hat, his hat, and she wants to open a portal and send this thing back to the Enchanted Forest because they kind of think that the Enchanted Forest is sort of destroyed. It was destroyed by the curse. Unfortunately, as they're doing this, because Emma helps Regina do it, that's the only way they can kind of use magic is if they work together. Teamwork, there's a reason they're next to each other on the board. Emma and Snow fall through the hat portal and then the portal closes. So they just got sent back to the Enchanted Forest, which we're not even sure if it exists, but they get sent back, these two, along with the wraith. So that's not good. Back in the Enchanted Forest, Philip goes to sacrifice himself to the wraith because so it won't hurt these two, and he does. And he essentially gets his soul sucked out. So they like lay him to rest in the same place where Aurora was sleeping, so we're not entirely sure if he's dead or if he's sleeping, I don't really understand. But they kind of lay him to rest at the same place where um, Aurora was woken up, so now it's kind of these two girls against the world. Henry is making everyone promise things this episode. He makes Regina promise to get Snow and Emma back, because remember, they're his family, of course. Emma's his mother and Snow's his grandmother and David's his grandfather, and for those of you who have seen the show, this is gonna keep happening. But until then, he's going to stay with David, who is his grandfather. At the end of the episode, with no other preamble, Belle comes back from her walk. She went on a walk. Meanwhile, the town looks like this because the wraith is wrecking havoc. So she goes through a walk in this tornado, but I digress, and forgives Gold for lying to her based on the fact that the others defeated the wraith. He did nothing. He gave nothing. But she forgives him and he's like, well, no, no, no. You need to leave because I'm a monster. And you know what, he's right. But she's like, Nar, don't you see? That's exactly the reason I have to stay. <sighs> she said, I can fix him and I'm gonna spend six more seasons doing it. Anyway, everyone vows to get Emma and Snow back. Um, David takes Henry in um, just to live with him. And he says to Henry, I will find them. I will always find them. Who remembers that? If you remember that, you get a point. <laughs> Back in the Enchanted Forest, Mulan drops the bomb that when Regina's curse came, there was a small corner of the land that was saved by the curse that didn't go to Storybrooke, which is why we have these characters in the Enchanted Forest at the moment. But something saved them and nobody really knows how. Then, in the spot where the wraith first appeared, under a bunch of rubble, guess who appears? Emma and Snow. Season 2, Episode 2, We Are Both. Remember when I said that the plot lines get a little dicey? This is where that comes in. Um, basically, we have three storylines, two of which are happening at the same time. So we have Storybrooke in our real world, as per usual, but now we have the Enchanted Forest in our current timeline, in the same time frame as Storybrooke. So this is the Enchanted Forest where Emma and Snow and Aurora and Mulan are. It's happening at the same time as our folks in Storybrooke are going on their adventures. Still though, we also have the Enchanted Forest in the past, like normal, before Regina's curse. So we're gonna be bouncing around between three different timelines. So for example, if Enchanted Forest passed, if I say that, it means before Regina's curse. If I say in the Enchanted Forest in the present, it means these yahoos over here hanging out doing their thing. And then Storybrooke means Storybrooke. Yes? And then it gets more complicated later on, but that's going to be for day two of filming this video. <laughs> we open in Storybrooke. The dwarves are investigating the town line. Remember how last season, anyone who crossed the town line would get in a terrible accident. It happened to Emma like three times. It happened to Cinderella. It happened to a couple different people. Well, they're trying to figure out if this is still the case, like what happens when they try and leave Storybrooke. Sneezy, one of the dwarves, draws the shortest straw and they push him over the town line. Of course, something magic happens and he forgets who he is and he is stuck in his cursed self. So that means that he doesn't know he's a fairy tale character. He thinks he's his normal pre-broken curse storybook self. Does that make sense? He doesn't know he's from the Enchanted Forest. He thinks he's normal. 
So they realize that anyone who crosses the town line will lose their memories and become their pre-curse self, which means no one can leave Storybrooke. Ruby, David, and the gang are setting up disaster relief because remember the Wraith terrorized the town while Belle was out on her evening walk. Houses are destroyed, family members are just finding each other after the curse was broken, it's a mess. David is under a lot of pressure because he's the prince, but he breaks away from all this and goes to talk to Regina, and he demands to tell him more about this hat that um, Snow and Emma fell through. But she's holding out, she won't tell him about Jefferson, um, also her magic, we discover, is on and off. So her and Emma got the hat to work, but because Emma's not here anymore, Emma's the savior, that's why she's special. She, you know, she saved everyone. But Regina can't really do magic at the moment. Um, here's where we get our first look into the enchanted forest in the past. We see a young Regina. Um, remember, young Regina is a horse girl. She is on the run from her mother, um, who is awful. Remember, her mother is Cora. Cora is trying to get young Regina to marry the king, as we know that happens, but this is before that happens. Um, and she's using this book of spells to pretty much, you know, as we've seen it before, abuse Regina and force her to do what Cora wants. She wants nothing but to be free. At this point, Daniel's already dead. She's already killed Daniel. You know, all she wants is her freedom. She wants to get away from this whole marriage plot happening. And what is freedom? Well, Cora says that power is freedom. And what is power? Well, we all know that power is magic. And Regina realizes she has to steal her mother's book of spells in order to get power. So Regina does so. She steals her mother's book of spells and summons none other than Rumpelstiltskin. Back in Storybrooke, Regina goes to gold to get this book of spells. Um, meanwhile, Henry and David use the story book to figure out that the hat does belong to Jefferson. Um, David goes to Gold to get like a tracking potion that'll help him find Jefferson. And when he does find Jefferson, um, Jefferson is stuck under a car, um, which shouldn't be as funny as it was because this means he was stuck under a car for at least two days. Um, I digress. Anyway, David threatens him because he's having none of this bullshit of these like villains and morally gray people. He just wants Snow and Emma back. <laughs> He's just gaslighting. He's gatekeeping. He's girl bossing this episode. He's learning his paycheck. He threatens gold. He threatens Jefferson. He threatens everyone. He's just, he's, he's on his way. He's getting his paycheck as sheriff. <laughs> Meanwhile, Regina uses the spell book and her magic to crash a Storybrooke town hall meeting and take Henry back because she used the story book. Wait, she used the spell book to get her magic back. Um, and she wants to take Henry back, but Henry runs away just like Regina did when she was younger. But Henry runs away from Regina, just like Regina ran away from Cora when she was younger. Back in the Enchanted Forest in the past, Regina, sorry, Rumpelstiltskin gives Regina a mirror. It's a portal. Regina has to push her mother through the portal in order to get rid of her, and Regina will be free. Regina gets so angry with Cora that in order to push her through this portal, she accidentally uses magic that she didn't know she had. When Regina tries to leave to escape marrying the king, Rumpel appears and he's like, hold on, didn't that feel good? Didn't you feel powerful? And he basically offers to teach her magic. So this is the beginning of Regina's magic arc. She says yes, as long as she doesn't become like her mother. Back in Storybrooke, everyone is trying to leave town. Everyone has lined up like it's a hurricane and they are trying to go across the town line even though they know they'll forget about who they are. They just want out of it, they're tired of this. Um, they're just sick and tired of being in Storybrooke and knowing things, which honestly, fair. Knowing facts is not easy. But David and Red, David and Red, stop them and um, stop everyone from leaving town. And David gives a nice speech about how they are both their cursed selves and their enchanted forest selves. They need to be celebrating their weaknesses and their strengths. They are both, hence the title of the episode, We Are Both. At the end of the episode, Regina does some soul searching and realizes that she is becoming like her mother. So she tells Henry to go home with David because she knows if you hold on to someone too hard, that doesn't mean they'll love you. She learned that from Cora. She wants to give Henry this choice to make because she's kind of realizing that she wants to redeem herself in his eyes so that he wants to be her son. Back in the Enchanted Forest, in the present, with these yahoos over here, Snow and Emma have become prisoners of Mulan, Aurora and Mulan, 
um, because they blame them for bringing the wraith over, essentially. Which is fair, because they kind of did, because they fell through the portal with the wraith, and then the wraith killed Philip, and whatever. Um, so they bring them to a refugee camp where they are thrown in jail. So the refugee camp is this refugee camp for people who survived Regina's curse, but the land still was destroyed, so just the people are kind of left to fend for themselves. Very Walking Dead, even though I've only seen like two episodes, you get the idea. Guess who else is in jail with them? None other than Cora. Season two, episode three, Lady of the Lake. So, in the Enchanted Forest, in the past, we are in the era where Snow and Charming are trying to take back their kingdom from Regina. I'm forgetting where everyone is. So, Snow and Charming trying to take back their kingdom from the Evil Queen. This is post her waking up from the Sleeping Curse. This is them in their girl boss era, in their warmongering era. So, Snow, Charming, Red, and all the friends are kind of in this war council to take back their kingdom. Turns out Regina has hired a new war um, general named Lancelot of the Round Table. There he is. Are you up to date on your Arthurian legends? Because I'm not. I read one book in fifth grade and I think I've seen Avalon High one time. And that's all I got for King Arthur legends. But this is Lancelot of the Round Table. Snow and Charming have to split up because they're under attack. They're in battle or whatever. And Snow gets captured by Lancelot. Back in the Enchanted Forest in the present, Snow recognizes Korra because remember, she kind of grew up with Korra for some time in the palace before, um, I guess, before Korra got pushed through that mirror if the timelines are right. Immediately does not trust her. Everyone knows Korra is evil, but Emma kind of knows they have no options. They have no allies right now. Snow and Emma get pulled out of the pit to have an audience with the leader. The leader of this refugee camp is Lancelot. But now, Snow and Lancelot are friends, even though he kidnapped her in the past timeline. <laughs> um, so that's good. Snow says that they can trust Lancelot. They rehash this idea that some corner of the Enchanted Forest was saved from Regina's curse, but again, they still don't know how, so that's the big mystery now. Also, the ogres. Do you remember all of the ogre wars? That's the reason that Belle had to go with Rumpelstiltskin. It's the reason that, like, uh, I think, I'm trying to remember what episodes we covered last um, video. It's the reason that Balefire was gonna get drafted, you know, all of these things. The ogres are back. Because everyone got cursed and the land got destroyed, the ogres have now taken over the land. Um, so sometimes you have to fight an ogre, just so you know. Snow's got this plan to return to her castle um, and go back through the wardrobe that sent Emma to Maine in the first place. Remember, Geppetto made a wardrobe that sent Pinocchio and Emma through, and she wants to find the wardrobe and use it again. So they head out with Mulan, um, but Aurora uh, tags along. She essentially attacks them because she still blames them for Philip's death. But now she's on the adventure too, so we've got the four girlies, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the four girlies of the apocalypse. Meanwhile, they're arguing. Emma makes the mistake of shooting her gun, which um, draws a bunch of ogres, and they have to run from ogres. <laughs> Back in the past, remember Lancelot, who is currently working for Regina, brings Snow not to Regina, but to King George. His picture is so dark, I'm so sorry. I should have fixed that, but I didn't. He brings her to King George. And we don't like King George, remember, he does not like Prince Charming, he does not like Snow. He's kind of on the side of Regina, in a way. Anyway, he's kind of a bitch, so he tricks Snow into drinking a potion that he later reveals will not allow her to have a child. So that sucks. They essentially throw her back to suffer and ha like this is like her punishment for being snow white i'm not entirely sure this is her punishment for daring to fall in love with prince charming he's just a bitch we just don't like him so her punishment is to have to tell him that they can't have kids essentially which you know she wants kids so this is important to her lancelot comes with her because he feels bad he did not know george was going to do that and so now he's on their side and he's like we're going to fix this as this is happening, he is visiting his mother, and they had decided before to regroup at his mother's house. This is Ruth. She was in the last season, but I forgot to put her picture on the board. So um, now she's back. We love her. She's an icon. So they regroup at Ruth's house. B -b Whoa, say that five times fast. But George's men find them and shoot Ruth with a poison arrow. And so Ruth starts dying. So now this gang has to 
Well, Snow hasn't told anyone she can't have kids yet. Right now, so far, according to them, the only problem is that Ruth is dying. But remember Lake Nostos? Remember when Catherine's golden boyfriend, who is not on the board anymore, <laughs> he, got, he got deleted apparently. Remember when they cured Catherine's golden boyfriend with the healing water from Lake Nostos? They're like, well, we can do that again. We can just go back and use the healing water. They get to Lake Nostos and it's dried up because remember David killed the siren that like was gatekeeping the water so that he could get water for Catherine, but because the siren is dead, the water dries up. So um, they find one little seashell full of water, just one sip, which is enough to cure someone. But is it gonna cure Ruth, who's dying, or Snow, who can't have kids? You know, if you think about it, I'm sure there's a subtext here. There's definitely a subtext about how women's lives are less important than the lives of unborn children. <sighs> I hate it here, I hate it here. To be clear, I'm pro-choice. <laughs> I'm just thinking of, oh. Anyway, <laughs> guess we'll find out what happens next. Take a guess. So, Charming's mother goes to drink the water, but it doesn't work. She says her only regret is that she won't be able to see them marry. So they get married, Lancelot marries them, because as a knight you can do that. They get married right as she dies. So she dies, and then Snow somehow realizes that the curse her curse is broken, so she can have children again. Right? Right. She can have a child now. Because Ruth had Lancelot put the magic water in their wedding cup, so they drank the magic water. So Ruth dies, and Snow can now potentially have a child. We're not going to read too much into it. Or maybe we can. Um, meanwhile, back in Storybrooke, Henry sneaks into Regina's vault, um, to find magic to help get Jefferson's hat working, but David catches him and basically tells him to go to school. Henry is very worried about his mom and his grandma, and I don't blame him, but David kind of hadn't really let Henry in on the plan, and so now David agrees to kind of let Henry in on the plan, kind of mentor him so that he's not doing stupid things like sneaking into his mother's vault and stealing magic. Back in the Enchanted Forest in the present, so they roll up to Snow's castle, and they find the wardrobe in Emma's nursery. Sadly, there's no magic left. Luckily, Lancelot rolls up to help him out. How did he know they were there? We don't know. But Snow realizes that Lancelot, for some reason, knows Henry's name, and they never told Lancelot Henry's name. But you know who did tell someone Henry's name? Earlier, Emma had told Cora Henry's name, because Emma wasn't being very smart. Turns out Lancelot is actually dead, and Cora has been posing as him this entire time. Um, Cora attacks them, and because she wants to go to Storybrooke, that's her goal. Cora attacks them, and Emma sets fire to the wardrobe so that Cora can get back to Storybrooke and wreak havoc. Unfortunately, that also means they can't get back to Storybrooke. And even though Emma set the wardrobe on fire, Cora collected the ashes, which allegedly are still magic. We don't know. And also at the end of the episode, David starts teaching Henry how to sword fight, which is so cute because all Henry wants is to be a knight with his family in the Enchanted Forest. Um, also, Jefferson reunites with his daughter. I don't. I guess that didn't happen last season. I guess that's not what happened. No, because the curse wasn't broken. We didn't see them reunite. Yeah, so he reunites with his daughter, so that's good. Season 2, episode 4, The Crocodile. So we open on gold, giving Belle a nice necklace. But Grumpy comes in the shop because Grumpy needs help when we go to Rumpelstiltskin when we need help. Grumpy comes in, even though he needs help, he insults Gold, and Gold um, attacks Grumpy because Gold is a bitch. Um, and Belle is like, no, 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 stop. You can't be doing this anymore. But then Belle wakes up, and it was a dream. So Belle is having stress dreams about her abusive, violent husband. Are we surprised? No. She wakes up to find gold in the basement, spinning straw into gold, even though he'd promised not to do magic. He'd promised a lot of things. We've made and broken a lot of promises. Um, she demands that he explain why he brought magic to Storybrooke, and he can't. He won't explain it to her. Back in the Enchanted Forest in the past, remember when Rumpelstiltskin became the Dark One? Remember Balefire? Um, we flash back to them at their village. 
and Balefire has a mother named Mila, truly running out of room. Remember her, she's important. Um, so one day Mila is not at the house and they go out looking for her. Turns out she is in a tavern drinking with some pirates, including a man named Killian Jones. That's Killian Jones. Very important. If you know, you know. Mila is mad because remember, wait, we have not seen this yet, but he had run away from the war. So when he was drafted into the war, he ran away and he is branded the village coward. She does not like him anymore because everyone calls him a coward. Rumple, later, he goes home. Later, he hears that she has been kidnapped by Killian Jones. And so he tries to stop Killian from taking her. He can't bring himself to fight Killian um, because he's a coward, essentially. Back in Storybrooke, the dwarves and David are mining for fairy dust. So. You might remember this, but in the mines, you mine diamonds under Storybrooke and you get fairy dust. And the idea is that if they get enough fairy dust, Mother Superior can use it to bring Snow and Emma back. Meanwhile, Belle leaves Rumpel, start counting, take a shot, do whatever you want. Belle leaves Rumpel and he goes looking for her and he asks Belle's dad, Mo French, another awful picture, these, these poor father figures. <laughs> Mo does not know where Belle is or he claims he does not know. Belle has actually gone to Granny's where her and Ruby meet and they immediately hit it off. They're besties. I can't remember what happens exactly, but there's some girl boss bonding happening. Ruby offers Belle a room at Granny's. Ruby also tells Belle that the library in Storybrooke has been closed forever and they really need a new librarian if she wants something to do. So Belle goes to look at the library. It's locked up right now, for now, but who finds her but none other than a man named Mr. Smee. Mr. Smee is a man who we saw with Killian in the pirate tavern moment thing happening. And he kidnaps Belle. <laughs> Back in the Enchanted Forest, we've had kind of a time jump and he's the dark one now. So the previous vignette happened before he became the dark one, but now he's the dark one and allegedly he's no longer a coward. At this point, he's lost his son. So remember how Balefire fell through the portal? Rumple had kind of let him go because he chose magic over Balefire. So he's grieving. So not only has he lost Mila to the pirate, he's also lost his son. And Mr. Smee comes to strike a deal with him. Smee has a magic bean that can transport people between worlds. Remember, that's what he fell through. That's what made the portal. Killian rolls up to the same tavern and catches Rumple's eye. He recognizes Killian from when Mila was allegedly kidnapped. Killian takes one look at him and he's like, who's this crocodile? And he's not wrong. The picture's not up here, but here's the picture. You see his skin. You see where the name Crocodile is coming from. Rumpel reveals that he is that man. He is Mila's husband. And he asks about Mila. And Killian reveals that Mila is dead. So Rumpel wants a rematch on their duel. And this time, he's going to fight back. So they duel on a poorly lit green screen soundstage. Um, the choreography is cool, though. Not as cool as Carrie Elwes and Maddie Pakinson training nine to five for four months to shoot their duel in The Princess Bride and then changing it to make the duel longer, like two days before they shot it and adding more choreography because they got so good at sword fighting that they just kind of became able to pick up new sword fighting choreography in no time because they'd been training eight hours a day without fighting doubles. Nothing's better than The Princess Bride is the moral of the story, but their duel's pretty cool. Killian loses and Rumpel is about to rip his heart out when Mila rolls up. Guess what? She's not dead. Surprise, surprise. Mila reveals that she had fallen in love with Killian and had gone with him willingly. She had not been kidnapped. Mila trades Killian's life for the magic bean because she'd taken the magic bean off Mr. Smee. Anyway, basically, magic bean in exchange that he can live. Um, Rumpel takes the deal. But then, out of revenge, he kills Mila. He rips out his own wife's heart and crushes it because she left him and Balefire. Bit hypocritical because he also left Balefire, but that's Rumpel's character. Then he also cuts off Killian's hand, the hand that he believed held the bean. Okay, the bean is bouncing around. Anyway, he cuts off Killian's hands because, hand because that hand was holding the bean at some point in time. That's important. Please write that down. Killian 
grabs a hook from his ship and tries to stab him with the hook, but it doesn't kill him. And Rempel runs away with the bean, <laughs> or so he thinks. Killian vows to one day kill Rumpelstiltskin, or the man he, crawls, he calls the crocodile. Turns out in the end, Killian had the bean in his other hand, so the hand that Rumpel cut off was not the <laughs> correct hand. But he's lost a hand, and so guess what he replaces it with? A hook. And he takes on a new name, and Killian Jones is now known as Captain Hook. Remember him? Yeah, he's hot now. I mean, look at the smolder. I mean, come on. Hook uses the bean to open a portal to a land where people never grow old. This land is called Neverland. Back in Storybrooke, Gold goes to David for help to find Belle, because remember, she's kind of disappeared, and David agrees. Turns out it was Belle's father who had Smee kidnap her, and um, because she is still in love with Rumpel, and her father does not like this. So in order to save her from herself, slash save her from Rumpel, he puts her in a mine cart, remember in the mines under Storybrooke, and sends the mine cart like zooming to go over the town lines that she loses her memories. Like a mine cart like in Minecraft, like she's riding, that's what's going on. Luckily, our girl bosses find Belle and save her. Belle has a girl boss moment for herself where she tells off both Rumpel and her father for trying to control her, as she should. At the end of the episode, Ruby is teaching Belle what pancakes are. Adorable, I know. And when she remembers that someone dropped a key off for Belle, and Belle takes the key and she realizes it's the key to the library. When she goes in the library, um, it was Gold who had dropped the key off for her. Gold's in the library. This is his idea of an apology. Um, he explains that he brought back magic to break this new curse. The new curse is this memory loss happening on the town line because he can't leave Storybrooke to go look for Bellfire. Because remember, Bellfire got sent to a land without magic. That is our world, that is Earth, our planet. But because they can't leave Storybrooke, he can't find Bellfire. And obviously, Bellfire's not in Storybrooke. So she forgives him because she's like, "R, oh, I understand why you brought back magic to find your son. That was bad. I'm so sorry to any Australians. Please feel free to send a hate comment. I deserve it. So she forgives him again. And yet the next scene is him beating the shit out of Smee for capturing Belle in order to get information. Oh yeah, but then he's also interrogating Mr. Smee about Captain Hook. He's like, where is he? I know someone wants me dead, but Captain Hook, he's not here yet. We don't know where he is. Just kidding, I take that back. Back in the Enchanted Forest in the present with these yahoos over here, guess who's joined Korra on their little adventure? Captain Hook is the newest addition to Korra's little team. Season two, episode five, The Doctor. I hate this episode. I think it's stupid. In the Enchanted Forest in the present, these yahoos, so Aurora, Mulan, Snow, and Emma, return from their escapade to the castle to find the refugee camp has been decimated. Korra has killed everyone. Everyone except this one guy in the rubble that we know is Captain Hook. In Storybrooke, David hits Whale in the face because remember him and Mary Margaret had a little fling during the curse. Anyway, we open with David hitting Whale in the face for that because masculinity. Dr. Whale is trying to figure out if all of the lands, not just the enchanted forest still exist. Because actually nobody really knows who Dr. Whale is. Like nobody knows which fairy tale character he is. Meanwhile, Regina goes to Hopper to get help on like not using magic. Where's Hopper? There he is. Because not using magic is kind of like a drug for her. Like it's addicting. Because she wants to keep her promise to Henry to not use magic, to be a better person, etc, etc, etc. In the Enchanted Forest in the past, remember it's kind of complicated, Rumpel is in his era of teaching young Regina how to use magic. And at this moment in time, he's teaching her how to rip a heart out of something. They're practicing on a horse. And we learn this very important tidbit of information. This is important. You're going to want to write this down. When you rip out someone's heart, it becomes enchanted and it starts to glow. And you can do one of two things. You can either crush it, kill the person, or you can use the heart and control the person, like you have mind-body control over them. So just know that going forward. But Regina, in their little lesson, won't crush 
the horse's heart because that is the way that Cora killed Daniel. Remember Daniel. Back in Storybrooke, we learn that Regina has preserved Daniel's body in a crypt with an enchantment spell, so that's great. On the drive home, she starts seeing Daniel everywhere. When she checks for his body in the crypt, she realizes that it's gone. Regina finds Dr. Whale in his lab. Um, Dr. Whale has passed out. He's been drinking or something. He's been trying, he stole Daniel's body, I think, to try and bring him back from the dead. And it worked, but Daniel is not the same as he once was. We know this trope. You don't come back from the dead normal. David and Regina realize that weird zombie Daniel is on his way to the stables, and that's where Henry is, because Henry's doing like a riding lesson. So they rush off to protect Henry um, from weird zombie Daniel. Zombie Daniel is clearly suffering, like it's not fun being revamped by Dr. Whale. And so they put him out of his misery and Regina is forced to kill him a second time and really let go of him for once. In the Enchanted Forest in the past, Regina admits that she had wanted to learn magic to bring Daniel back to life. And Rumpel refuses to help her because magic can't do that. Um, so how had Dr. Whale in Storybrooke been able to bring him back to life? Well, Regina is introduced to Dr. Whale in the Enchanted Forest, who is none other than Dr. Frankenstein, a visitor from another land. He goes to bring Daniel back from the dead in the science way, and he needs one of those enchanted hearts. So um, Regina brings him a heart. I don't remember whose. And luckily, Daniel is only mostly dead, not all the way dead, like in The Princess Bride. <laughs> and um, Frankenstein is able to attempt to bring Daniel back to life, but even with the enchanted heart, Frankenstein fails. At the end of the episode, Regina gets her makeover, where she becomes the evil queen. She becomes her dark queen self. At the end of the episode, we learned that Rumpel had hired Dr. Frankenstein to make Regina believe it wasn't possible to bring someone back, even though later we learned it is, because in Storybrooke he brought him back, but it still didn't work. Whatever. And also at the end of the episode, Dr. Frankenstein goes back to his world, and his world is like a black and white, um, you know, film, and he uses the enchanted heart to bring to life his monster, Frankenstein's monster. <sighs> Back in the enchanted forest, remember they found him amongst the rubble. He's the only sur survivor of Korra's massacre. Emma doesn't trust this man. Remember, she can tell when someone's lying to her. So she gambles with fate. She ties him up. This is where the screenshot is from. She's serving. She ties him up and like kind of, I think she shoots her gun or does something to summon the ogres. And she's like, if you don't tell me who you are, I'm gonna leave you here to die. And everyone's like, Emma, like we gotta go. The ogres are on their way. And she's like, nah, -uh -uh. not this man lying. And so he re does reveal that um, he's Captain Hook and that he's a spy for Korra. He also re reveals that Korra is gonna use the ashes of the wardrobe to open a portal, but Hook makes a deal. He's like, I'll side with you guys. Like, I just want someone to get me back to Storybrooke because his goal is to kill Rumpelstiltskin. Their goal is to kill each other. And so his deal is that he just needs to get back to Storybrooke so he'll help them out. And they need to find a compass in order to get back to Storybrooke. And in order to get the compass, they have to climb a beanstalk. Understood? Thank God that episode's over. I always thought it was stupid. That's all. Season 2, Episode 6, Tallahassee. Now this is a good episode. <laughs> so, timelines are a little dicey on this one as well. In the Enchanted Forest, in the present, Emma and Hook decide to climb the magic beanstalk to get the magic compass. So, you climb the beanstalk and, um, you, what do you do? You go in the giant's lair. It's like Jack and the Beanstalk. You climb the beanstalk to get to the giant and you steal the compass from the giant. Got it? Emma and Hook decide to climb it, um, and Emma makes Mulan promise that if they're not back in 10 hours to cut the huge beanstalk down, as if no one else is going to notice that, just so that they can get away, so that these yahoos can get away from the giant. We have a new timeline. In the past, before the Storybrooke curse, in Portland, Oregon, we see a younger Emma, she looks like this, stealing a yellow car. This is the car she drives around Storybrooke. As she's stealing this car, there's a guy in the back. Remember this guy? His name is Neil. 
Um, they get pulled over and Neil covers for them. He's like, sorry, I'm just trying to teach my girlfriend how to drive stick. You know, women, they can't drive. And Emma's <laughs> indignant about that. Turns out Neil had also stolen that car. So Emma had just stolen a stolen car. We flash forward to Emma and Neil um, stealing from a store. They're in their Bonnie and Clyde era. They've kind of fallen in love and they're going around thieving and just kind of being terrors to the general public. So they're stealing from a store, um, whatever, they kind of get away from it, with it. And they decide they want to settle down somewhere. They're tired of life on the road. They're tired of all this, you know, whatever, running from the cops. And they choose um, to settle down in Tallahassee, Florida. And the day I was watching this episode was the day that I realized that Tallahassee is not in Tennessee. For some reason, <laughs> don't, don't look at me like that. I thought it, I just stereotyped it to be in Tennessee. It just sounds right. Tallah Sometimes I, I'm a marvel to myself. Anyway, at the ripe age of 21, I've learned that Tallahassee is in Florida after watching this show for maybe the third or fourth time. <laughs> Back in the Enchanted Forest in the present, as they wait for Hook and Emma to get down from the beanstalk, Snow notices that Aurora is not sleeping. This is a side effect of the sleeping curse, is not being able to sleep because you're having terrible nightmares. She keeps dreaming that she is in a room on fire, and in one of the corners of the room, there's someone else sitting there staring at her. And this is terrifying, she does not want to sleep. Meanwhile, Emma and Hook are having some steamy moments. She cuts her hand, he bandages her up. It's a whole thing. He calls her a, a tough lass. Anyway, they have this power powder that Mulan had given them to knock the giant out. Oh, we need the giant. He looks like this. He'll come. He'll he'll come in handy later. I promise. There. Well, no. He should be like right here. There he is. So they do it, and they get the compass from the giant. Meanwhile, in the Neil and Emma Portland, Oregon story. Neil is wanted by the police for stealing watches. Basically, he had stolen a bunch of watches and left them in a train station locker. Emma offers to get the watches because she's not as wanted as he is um, so that they can sell them and get enough money to change their identities and move to Tallahassee, which is in Florida, as we've learned. Emma steals the watches and Neil gives her one um, before he goes off to sell them to this guy. Um, he promises to meet at their rendezvous point at like midnight or whatever. But when he goes to f sell the watches, he's interrupted by none other than a guy named August. Remember him? So Pinocchio himself, who came over with Emma as a baby, but then abandoned her and grew up and now is the same age, they're the same age, but he needs to get her back to Storybrooke. So this is before she arrives at Storybrooke. He's the one trying to guide her to Storybrooke so she can get there eventually and break the curse. Are we kind of keeping up? It's a little bit dicey. August tells Neil that if he stays with Emma, she'll never fulfill her destiny of breaking a curse. And he's like, what are you talking about? And August is like, I've got one thing that'll make you believe me. That'll make you believe in magic and curses. And he opens his... Um, typewriter box and whatever is in there makes Neil trust August and trust August's word. August promises that if Emma breaks the curse, he'll send Neil a postcard. Remember the postcard from the first episode? Neil leaves Emma the money from the watches and the car and a little swan charm that she wears around her neck. We end on Emma getting arrested. Neil ratted her out and abandoned her because August told him to. Um, we flash forward to see that Emma has a positive pregnancy test in jail. In the Enchanted Forest in the present, the giant wakes up and Hook and Emma um, have to fight their way out. But when Emma spares the giant's life, he gives her the compass for free. However, she still does not trust Hook, so she locks Hook up, tells um, the giant to let Hook go in like three days. Just give them a three-day head start because she does not trust Hook, even though they just kind of went on this little steamy adventure. <laughs> Just as Mulan is starting to cut down the beanstalk, Emma rolls up, or down, I guess. She rolls down. She climbs down the beanstalk and they get a move on because they have the compass now. At the end of the episode, Henry wakes up from a nightmare where he is in a burning room, a room on fire, and there's someone staring at him from across the room. Season two, episode seven, Child of the Moon. So, the dwarves, remember in Storybrooke how they're mining for fairy dust 
and they're like if they find diamonds they can make fairy dust well they find a shit ton of diamonds and they've they've done it they found fairy dust and they're like we can get emma and snow back we finally have like light good magic whatever however they still need jefferson's hat to do this so their plan is to kind of use the fairy dust to enchant the hat again meanwhile ruby meets this guy named billy he is not on here i am so sorry to that man do i have an extra white boy prince no this man's not a white boy Oh, which makes everything even sadder. Whatever, Billy's not going up there. He deserves better than to be on this board. Just know that. So Billy asks her out for a drink. She's hesitant to say yes, and Belle saves her from this little awkward situation because Belle is Ruby's wing woman, and they are each other's wing woman, and they should fall in love. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. The reason she is hesitant is be the reason Ruby is hesitant. Sorry to go out with a guy. It's because tonight is the first full moon since the curse broke. Remember, Ruby is a werewolf. We learned this last season, and every full moon, she becomes a wolf. And she's worried that she won't have control over her magic in the same way that she had in the Enchanted Forest. So, Granny helps Red lock herself. Is her name Ruby or Red in this world? It's Red in the Enchanted Forest and Ruby in Storybrooke, and I'm just going to use it interchangeably because my brain can't keep that straight, apparently. So Granny helps Red lock herself in the freezer so she doesn't hurt anyone. Meanwhile, King George, the storybook version of King George, confronts David, and he pretty much uh, threatens his questions his power as sheriff. Because in now that Emma's gone, David is taken over sh as sheriff. It just makes sense. He's the prince. He's a cop. He's Emma's dad. Just hold on to that for a minute. In the Enchanted Forest, Snow and Red are running from the evil queen's soldiers. This happens a lot. Um, this is in the era where Snow is wanted by the Queen. Well, she's always wanted by the Queen, but kind of pre-war, it does not matter. Red's, in the hassle, Red's cloak is torn, and she's worried that um, if her cloak is torn, it might not um, keep her from turning into a wolf. Remember, it's the red cloak that stops her from turning into a wolf. Um, we learned that when she killed her last boyfriend. Red makes them split up because she's worried about hurting Snow. In the morning, Red wakes up to find her cape has worked. She did not turn into a werewolf, but there's a man with glowing eyes stalking her. He steals her cape and she chases after him, and his name is Quinn. Turns out he's a wolf too. There's a whole pack of wolves, and he offers to teach her how to be a werewolf. And they kind of go to this underground place to live where all the werewolf pack lives, and they're gonna teach her. And turns out, leader of the wolf pack is Red's mother, who is also not on the board. I don't, for some reason, all of Red's friends did not make it on the board. Sorry, guys. In Storybrooke, in the morning, they discover that Ruby is gone. There's claw marks all over the freezer. Obviously, she escaped. Granny and David go looking for her, um, but then they find her passed out in the woods. She doesn't remember anything. Billy, the guy from earlier, this is why I said it's sad that he's not a white boy prince, has been killed. They find him ripped in half um, in a ditch or something, I don't remember, but he's dead. Of course, because why would you treat any of your black characters nicely in this show? I don't know. <sighs> Billy's dead. Rest in peace. All signs point to it being red, her having killed another boyfriend because she's killed people before. Even she thinks she did it and she can't even remember. David does not believe she did it. He believes in the goodness inside of her or whatever. King George leads the rampage against, da uh, against Ruby and David and is like, David is letting this werewolf run around town. He's clearly not good enough to be sheriff and run the town. We just know King George hates David. Meanwhile, we get a look into Henry's fire dream. He keeps waking up with burns on his hands. Clearly, this dream in a room of fire is starting to kind of seek and seek, seep into the real world because he's getting burns all over his arms. Gold tells him the dream is a side effect of the sleeping curse, because remember when he put himself under a sleeping curse at the end of last season to get Emma to believe in magic? Are we, you're kind of there with me? So they've all been under the sleeping curse, including Snow. So anyone who's been under it has this weird red room fire dream. Gold gives him kind of like a necklace that'll keep him from being hurt when he sleeps. In the Enchanted Forest, the wolves teach Red how to control her wolf instinct by embracing them. So now she's kind of a werewolf, but she can control it, so that's good. Snow finds the hideout, um, and the other wolves clearly do not like her. But Red, um, and Red does not want to leave with Snow. She wants to stay at her home with her mother. And Snow's okay with this. She's like, I'll go on without you like I want you to be with your family. 
However, the queen's men, the queen's soldiers, find Snow in the hideout and the wolves don't like this and so they blame her for bringing the soldiers to them and so when they try and kill Snow, um, Red fights back against her mother because her mother is the one that ordered them to kill Snow and Snow's Ruby's friend, you get it. So when Red fights back, she accidentally kills her mother in order to save Snow. It's traumatizing. All of Ruby's episodes are so, so traumatizing. She, God, I can't. Back in Storybrooke, with Belle's help, they relocate Ruby to the library and they like chain her up inside the library so she can't become a wolf. And Belle is adamant that she stays with Ruby. She's like, Ruby, you're not a monster. You're not a beast. But she doesn't say that. But you know what? I'm just saying, we deserved, we deserved a pink line between these two. We deserved the real Beauty and the Beast story for the ages, for the people, for the girlies. We deserve so much more. I'm just saying, I look at the scene, watch, look at them. Ruby locks Belle in the library instead. and goes to sacrifice herself, because King George has kind of um, put together a mob. Mobs happen a lot in this town. The extras are working for their paycheck. They're always in the mob. She goes to sacrifice herself to the mob. Meanwhile, Granny and David find Ruby's hood, remember her red hood, her red cape, in a car along with a bloody ax. Remember Billy was like cut in half with an ax. Guess whose car it is? King George's. King George killed Billy and framed Ruby. David stops King George from killing Ruby and he helps her regain control because she had turned into a wolf at this point. He helps her regain control over her, her wolf form and he uses the cloak to turn Ruby back. In revenge, King George steals Jefferson's hat. Remember, they have to use the hat to get Emma and Snow back and he burns it so they can't open a portal to get Emma and Snow even though they have fairy dust. So. We're back to square one because the villains are villaining. Meanwhile, in Henry's dream, he uses the necklace to put out the fire, the necklace that gold had given him, and talk to Aurora. Aurora tells this to Snow and Emma, and they realize that with Henry and Aurora in the same dream, they can communicate between the Enchanted Forest and Storybrooke. Season two, episode eight, Into the Deep. In the Enchanted Forest, in the present, Hook climbs down from the beanstalk um, to meet Cora. He's in trouble with her because he does not have the compass. Emma stole the compass. Cora essentially abandons him and she goes back to the demolished refugee camp um, and pulls out an enchanted heart. She uses the enchanted heart to control all the people that she killed in the recent episode. Meanwhile, the gang has discovered that Aurora and Henry can communicate and they tell Henry that they need Rumpelstiltskin's help. Back in Storybrooke, Henry wakes up and he's like, they're alive, they're alive. <laughs> Henry tells Regina and David that Cora is trying to get to Storybrooke because this is what our heroes over here had told him. Regina goes to Gold for help and they have a terse conversation about how Cora can use Belle against Gold. Gold attempts to get his message through Henry. The Enchanted Forest crew need to go find magic squid ink from Rumpel's jail cell. Remember, he was in jail for a while before the Storybrooke curse happened. That's what trapped him in the first place. That's the reason he couldn't get out is because the squid ink stopped him from escaping. And that's what's gonna trap Korra and allow them to defeat her. In the Enchanted Forest in the present, the message doesn't exactly get across because the Enchanted Forest crew get attacked by the, min the minions, the, the, the zombies that Korra just resurrected. So the minions, the zombies, capture Aurora and bring her to Korra. Cora hints to Aurora that Philip could be brought back from his medallion wraith curse, but she still refuses to work with Cora because she's got her solid morals happening. Cora gives him an ultimatum. If they, if Emma doesn't give Cora the compass, Aurora is gonna die. Snow comes up with a plan to take some sleeping powder so she can essentially go back under the sleeping curse and put herself in the fiery room. Because remember, she was the OG under the sleeping curse. She can get back into that fiery room if she wants to. Back in Storybrooke, Henry gets burned again because Aurora pulled herself out of the dream when the minions attacked and that hurt Henry. So 
um, they don't want to send Henry back. So David offers to put himself under the sleeping curse so he can talk to Aurora, who is, she's now going to be talking to Snow because Aurora's been kidnapped, but he doesn't know that yet. So with Rumpel's help, David pricks his finger on the spindle of a spinning wheel, because that's how it works, and falls under the sleeping curse. Snow and David see each other in the fiery room, and he had planned to kiss her and wake up, because remember, true love's kiss is the only thing that can wake him up from the spindle or whatever, and he's able to pass on the message about the ink. But when they try to kiss, it doesn't work. They're kind of ghostly figures, like they can't touch each other or hug or kiss, and so they're He's stuck in the fiery room, she can get herself out of it, because uh, she's been there, done that, I don't really know. Which means that Snow will have to wake up David when they get back to Storybrooke. If they get back to Storybrooke. In the Enchanted Forest in the present, Hook rescues Aurora um, in, to take revenge on Korra because she abandoned him earlier in the episode. Um, Hook tells Aurora to pass along the message that, again, he'll help them defeat Korra if he gets passage to Storybrooke. Like, he's like, kind of wants to help them. But when Hook confronts Korra, he reveals that he ripped out Aurora's heart, so even though he let Aurora go, Korra can still kill or control Aurora. There's a lot of double crossing going on. Basically, Hook is still on Korra's side, is what we know as the audience. Snow wakes up from the sleeping curse. She and Emma discover that Mulan has ran away with the compass because um, she wants to get Aurora back. But before they can fight about it for too long, Aurora rolls up just in time. She seems fine. We know she's not, but she seems fine. What Mulan, Snow, and Emma don't know is that Korra is controlling Aurora's heart. Season 2, Episode 9, Queen of Hearts. In the Enchanted Forest in the past, we zoom in on Regina's evil queen castle. We're watching Captain Hook sneak into a prisoner's cell. Who is the prisoner but Belle? This is when she got taken prisoner. Um, by Regina after falling in love with Rumpelstiltskin. He wants to know how to kill Rumpelstiltskin, he thinks Belle knows. She's like, no, you don't need to kill him. He's actually good on the inside. He does not want to hear any of that bullshit, so he knocks her out. And Regina poofs in, and she's like, I know how to kill Rumpelstiltskin. And so Hook teams up with Regina. She only, they only team up if Hook will do her a favor. And what is the favor? Well, Regina explains that she has a curse coming that's going to take everyone to a new land called Storybrooke, but they don't know that yet. And Hook's job is to kill Korra because Regina does not want Korra following them into the new world. The thing is, Korra isn't in the Enchanted Forest. Remember, she got pushed through the mirror, so where is Korra? In Storybrooke, Gold and Regina can't be sure that David passed along the message to Snow because, again, he can't wake up from the sleeping curse. They are worried that if Emma and Snow get a portal open from the Enchanted Forest, Korra is going to come through. So uh, instead of doing anything else, they decide they're going to set a trap so that anyone who comes through any potential portal will just be killed on sight. Because they're villains, they don't really care for the whole benefit of the doubt, saving the world, good versus evil kind of thing. <laughs> Obviously this sucks because it very well could kill Snow and Emma if they defeat Korra and come through the portal, but they don't think that Snow and Emma are going to defeat Korra. Remember, remember the diamonds the dwarves found in the mines. Well, Gold and Regina steal all of the diamonds for this plan to set up this trap. In the Enchanted Forest in the present, our, our best buddies, our gal pals, make it to Rumpel's cell, but they can't find the squid ink anywhere. What they do find is a scroll with one name written over and over. Emma. This causes Emma to spiral because this is just another reminder that her entire life was just set up to be a curse breaker before she was even born. But they realize that the, the ink on the scroll is the squid ink they need. But as they are kind of figuring this out, Aurora traps them in Rumpel's cell, because remember she's being controlled, and Korra rolls up and steals the compass. Snow and Emma have this really well-written conversation about how Emma feels like a failure because they just got tricked, they got double-crossed. Emma's like, I'm not a real person, I'm just a vessel. Emma realizes she's only the savior because Mr. Gold has been pulling all the strings and she only broke the curse because he wanted her to. Aurora tells them to tie her up so she can't do any more damage because Cora still has her heart and Mulan vows to get her heart back and come back for Aurora. Listen, there's a reason. These two are so close on the board. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, there's a lot of homoerotic subtext going on. Will... 
Back in the Enchanted Forest in the past, Regina enchants Hook's hook so that he can rip out Cora's heart and kill her so that she doesn't come to the new world when the curse comes. Regina then sends Hook through a portal to Wonderland where Cora has become the Queen of Hearts. Get it? When she got pushed through the mirror, she got sent to Wonderland and she's the Queen of Hearts now because she can rip out people's hearts. It's part of Alice in Wonderland lore. Have you read the Lewis Carroll book? Is that the guy's name? But when Hook tries to rip out Cora's heart, she reveals that she took out her own heart and hid it so that nobody can use it against her. Makes sense, right? Cora then strikes a deal with Hook because what Regina didn't say, because this whole shtick is that Hook will be able to kill Rumpelstiltskin in this new world, but Cora is like, no, Regina's not telling you that you won't remember who you are in the new world. So how are you going to kill Rumpelstiltskin if you don't know who he is, if you don't know who you are? So Cora says that she can help him kill Rumpel. They come back through the hat portal from Wonderland, whatever, and Cora essentially plays dead. She pretends that Hook killed her. And so Cora, she wants essentially to be on Regina's side, but by then it's too late, the curse is already coming. And so instead of kind of getting on Regina's side of things, she decides to cast a spell that protects a corner of the land so that some of our fairy tale characters don't get brought over to Storybrooke. Does that make sense? And so the time in this corner of the land freezes until the Storybrooke curse is broken, but it doesn't matter because they've been saved. And she says, once the curse is broken, she'll go over to Storybrooke and be with Regina. Meanwhile, in the present, Cora and Hook head to Lake Nostos, the chokehold this magical healing lake has on people, and it's dry. Why are we surprised? It's dry. But Cora uses her magic to bring the water back. So they plan on using the magic from Lake Nostos along with the compass to get back to Storybrooke. Back in Storybrooke, Grumpy and, Grumpy and Red realize that the diamonds have been stolen by Regina and Gold. Everyone realizes that Gold and Regina have a nefarious plan going on. At the same time, uh, Gold and Regina set their deadly trap at the well, which is where the portals kind of always come through, to prevent anyone from coming through. In the Enchanted Forest in the present, Snow, Emma, and Mulan catch up to Cora and Hook, and they fight their way to get the compass and Aurora's heart. Mulan gets Aurora's heart and runs back to save her. Emma gets the compass after a very tension-filled sword fight with Hook, a very, a very bantery, flirtatious sword fight with Hook, so they can get through the portal. Cora tries to rip out Emma's heart, but Cora can't because Emma's the savior, and her savior, light magic, prevents Cora from ripping out her heart. Anyway, they defeat Cora. Snow and Emma jump through the portal, but remember, these two have a trap set at the portal, so that's not necessarily a good thing. Back in Storybrooke, Henry tries to convince Regina and Gold that Snow and Emma are gonna win. They're gonna defeat Cora. Don't set the trap. Don't kill anyone. He manages to succeed, and Regina takes away the curse by like soaking it up herself. It doesn't make sense. It's kind of part of Regina's five-step plan to win Henry back, whatever. Anyway, after a very tense moment where it looks like it did not work, Emma and Snow come through the portal and everyone is okay. They all reunite, happy families. Snow goes to wake up David and he says, oh, you found me. And she goes, did you ever doubt I would? Do you remember that? Do you remember that? You get a point if you remember that. Emma confronts Gold about the scroll, her predetermined fate, her predetermined lot in life to be the curse breaker and nothing else. He says, no, I created the curse for you, it's a product of true love, but it was Emma that did everything herself. She had the strength to do it. And the fact that Cora couldn't rip out her heart, that's magic. That means Emma has magic. Back in the Enchanted Forest, you know, these two have been defeated. They're at Lake Nostos now, but Hook reveals he has an ace up his sleeve. He had a magic bean he'd gotten from the giant. Remember when he kind of got left on the beanstalk? He had stolen a magic bean and him and Cora use it along with the magic of Lake Nostos to open a portal to Storybrooke and get there by getting on his pirate ship. And so these two have boarded the Jolly Roger, that's the name of Captain Hook's pirate ship, and are on the way to Storybrooke. Season two, episode 10, Cricket Game. The Cricket Game, sorry. Hook and Cora roll up to Storybrooke in their pirate ship, which you would think would be quite conspicuous considering it's a huge ship, but um, Cora uses her magic to kind of cloak it and make it invisible so nobody can see it. 
Hook realizes that because there's magic in Storybrooke, Rumple, he's not going to be able to kill Rumpelstiltskin because Rumpelstiltskin has magic. Like, he can't defeat Rumple unless Rumple is powerless. So it's a bit more complicated. In the Enchanted Forest in the past, Regina, as the evil queen, is watching what looks like a battle. She's watching the battle where Snow and Charming defeat King George's forces. This is post her sleeping curse and pre Storybrook curse. I know you guys are very smart and I know you can keep up. It's not easy though. So just, you know, take a sip of water. It's not gonna, it's not getting any better. It's not getting any easier from here. Regina ambushes Snow, but it's a trap. And so Snow and Charming capture Regina it's as the evil queen in the past, during the war. Back in Storybrook, all the good folks have a party at Granny's place to celebrate the fact that Snow and Emma have come back safe and sound. Regina walks in, everyone's like, the hell is she doing here? And Emma's kind of like, no, I invited her. Like, she did help us get over in her own twisted way. <laughs> Emma recognizes that Regina is trying to change for Henry and gives her a second chance. Emma reveals to Dr. Hopper, Dr. Hopper had told Emma that Regina was trying to change. Regina doesn't like this because like patient, doctor, patient confidentiality, he may have gotten his PhD from a curse, but Still, he broke confidentiality, and so Regina doesn't like that Emma has this insight. The next day, Regina confronts Archie for breaking doctor-patient confidentiality, but Regina walks away. Regina is then seen later entering Archie's flat. We watch Regina seemingly kill Archie. Like, I think he, like, choking him, something. But as she's walking away, we realize it's Cora disguised as Regina, framing Regina for killing Archie. The next day, Pongo, who is Archie's dog, finds Emma and they discover what looks like a murder scene and all signs point to Regina, who's already mad at Archie in the first place and was seen going into his apartment to murder him. They begin to think that maybe Gold is framing Regina. Um, Gold shows Emma how to use magic. She uses magic to extract Pongo's memory. Pongo's the dog and Pongo even saw Regina kill Archie, but again, it wasn't Regina, it was Cora. So really everyone's just convinced it's Regina. In the Enchanted Forest in the past, remember, they captured Regina, and so now the council of all the good people are trying to decide what to do with her, and everyone wants to kill her, but Snow pushes back. She thinks that Regina can change. When they go to execute her, Snow stops it. The arrows are flying, but luckily Rumpelstiltskin's in the crowd because he always knows what's going on, and he stops the arrows from hitting her. Snow knew Regina back when she was good, and so Snow thinks that Regina can change. Rumpel says he'll help them prove whether or not the queen can change, so Snow lets Regina go, saying it's a chance to let Regina start fresh, but then Regina tries to kill Snow anyway. This fails Rumpelstiltskin's little test. The trick of the magic is that now Regina can't directly kill Snow or Charming. It was kind of a deal. Now she can't actually hurt them, so they banish her for some reason for the plot. I'm just now realizing this is pre- this is pre-Sleeping Curse, because the reason that Regina couldn't outright kill Snow is because because of this plot twist. Now she can't really touch them. So she settles on putting Snow under a sleeping curse. So this is pre-sleeping curse. No, it's not. No, it is. No, it's, it's post-sleeping curse. She already tried the sleeping curse, it didn't work. So then these two rallied to defeat George and Regina and take back the kingdom. But now she can't directly kill these two because of whatever deal they made with Rumpelstiltskin. Please don't ask me to explain it. I'm close to tears already. So now this is what's going to lead her to the Storybrooke curse, where she brings everyone to Storybrooke. Oh, this is so confusing. Yes, correct. It's in my notes. At the end of the episode, we see Rumpel visit Regina in her like banishment castle or whatever. She's still the evil queen. I don't know. Banishment does not make any sense because she can still do harm. Whatever. For the plot. And that is when Rumpel begins to convince Regina to set a curse that will bring everyone to a new land. Back in Storybrooke, Emma arrests Regina and um, they try and t uh, trap her again, but she's got magic, I think, so they can't. And Emma has to tell Henry that Regina killed Archie because all signs point to Regina having killed Archie. Meanwhile, Cora is satisfied that Regina has lost everything now. Cora's plan is to kind of drive Regina to Cora's side so that Regina has no choice but to run to Cora for help. Also, Cora didn't kill Archie, she just kidnapped him, and we kind of see him locked in the basement, so that's good. Season 2, Episode 11, The Outsider. We open on Gold driving Mr. Smee. Remember, 
he captured Smee and beat him up like six episodes ago. He is going to drive Smee across the town line, but he takes a magic potion on Smee's red hat, puts the hat, pours it on the hat, puts the hat on Smee, pushes Smee across the town line, and the magic potion on the hat makes it so that Smee doesn't lose his memories. This means that Gold, if he uses the magic potion on like something he loves, like an, uh, a piece of clothing item that he loves, he can leave Storybrooke without losing his memories and go find his son, which is his goal. The next scene is everyone at Archie's funeral. It's very sad. Remember, we are in mourning. We think he's dead. Comedically, we then cut to Hook interrogating Archie um, about the whereabouts of Rumpelstiltskin's dagger, which is really the only thing that can kill him because he currently has magic. Archie doesn't know anything about the dagger, but under duress, he reveals the existence of Belle. In the Enchanted Forest, in the past, this is Belle's episode, and we love her for it. She's being a girl boss. She's on her own. Um, we zoom in on Belle, who is drinking in a tavern. This is after she left Rumple, after she left the castle, but before Regina captures her. We zoom in on Belle, who's drinking in a tavern. She overhears a bunch of men talking about wanting to kill this beast called the Yawagwe. So, remember when Belle gave dreamy or grumpy advice on how to get no Nova, you know, like how to get them to fall in love? Well, dreamy comes back and he's like, Belle, like you helped me get what I wanted. You helped me become happy. I want to encourage you to go with the men on this adventure to kill the Yaogwe. Dreamy or grumpy convinces her to go kind of to pay her like to like happily nicely pay her back. Like, hey, I got my adventure. Now it's time for you to go on yours. So she decides to go on the expedition, and Dreamy gives her some fairy dust, telling her that it might come in handy. Back in Storybrooke, Belle is minding her own business, working on organizing her books in the library, when Hook shows up. She recognizes him from when he broke into her cell at the Queen's Palace a couple of episodes ago. She knows that he wants to kill Rumpelstiltskin, um, and when Hook tries to capture her, she locks herself in like <laughs> the elevator in the library, it's a whole thing, and calls to Rumple for calls Rumple for backup and so he comes to get her um, and save her but they return to his shop and they find it a mess Hook has ransacked it while Gold was gone Hook has also stolen the shawl remember he was gonna put the potion on a piece of clothing he chose a shawl Hook has stolen the shawl that Rumple was gonna use to cross the town line Belle and Rumple argue about what to do Rumple wants her to stay but Belle wants to help him in the Enchanted Forest in the past this crew of men going to kill the monster called the Yawagwe make fun of Belle for, I don't know, being a woman, for reading, for doing anything, because she's a woman who can read. They kick her off the wagon and leave her behind. Luckily, she has a book about the Yawagwe for some reason, and it's in Chinese, it's in an ancient language that nobody can read, which is Mandarin. Luckily, Belle can read it. <laughs> Belle can read Mandarin. She had lied to them, and so she tracks the Yawagwe down herself after she had led them astray, the other guys. When well, she finds it in a cave, she goes to kill it, but it runs off because she was, it's kind of scary killing a monster. The other, there's another hunter who also wants to kill the Yaogwe, and this hunter is pissed that Belle um, chased the Yaogwe away. And that person is Mulan. So Mulan and Belle decide to team up to go find the Yaogwe and kill it. In Storybrooke, Belle is cleaning the library when she finds a sailor's knot. This somehow leads her to a book about knots, and she realizes that Hook has come to Storybrooke on his ship because he had dropped the sailor's knot when he was in the library or something. This is great for her. She's so smart. She finds the ship, even though it's cloaked. She's just very smart, and she finds it, and she even finds Archie, and she lets Archie go, and she's like, go tell people that you're alive. Of course, Hook then attacks her for sneaking around the ship. In this confrontation, Hook reveals that it was Rumpel that killed Mila because Belle was like, I can't trust you, you killed Rumpel's old wife. And he's like, nar. And he's not Australian. He, I think he's British. Is he British or is he just kind of pirate speak? I don't remember. He's like, Rumpel killed his own wife. So once again, Rumpel lying to Belle. But anyway, she still wants to protect Rumpel. Unfortunately, Belle still thinks that Rumpel can change. Gold rolls up to save her. She stops Gold from killing Hook because, well, she can change him. She can fix him. In the past, Mulan and Belle find the Yaogwe, but Mulan is suffering from an old injury, so she can't kill the beast, and she insists that Belle go try. 
When Belle goes to kill the Yaogwe, she realizes the monster is actually under a curse. Because remember, she kind of can recognize a monster under a curse, as we know. She uses the fairy dust that uh, Dreamy Grumpy had given her, and it transforms into a human, into Prince Philip. The Yaogwe, well, Prince Philip had gotten cursed by Maleficent, because, you know, this whole story to be a monster is the story. And then this is how these two first meet and they begin their quest to go find Aurora. So this is kind of this trio's backstory. This also makes Belle realize she has another beast to face. She's like, if I fixed him, I can fix him. You can't, you can't. And we all learn this the hard way. We all do, and we all really do. When she goes back to Rumpelstiltskin, she is kidnapped by none other than the evil queen. Back in Storybrooke, at the end of the episode, Archie rolls up because he's alive. Everyone realizes it was Cora who framed Archie all along. I'm not sure how we drew that conclusion so fast, but we managed it. We then watch Belle and Gold cross the town line using this enchanted scarf because she got it back from Hook because Hook stole it. And it works, but guess who comes out of the woodworks? Him. He shoots Belle across the town line so not only is she shot in like the shoulder or something but she also loses her memories immediately then hook immediately and hilariously gets hit by a random car flying over the town line not from inside of storybrook from outside of storybrook picture this bell shot across the town line rumple freaking out hook gets flipped over a car and hit and that's the end of the episode Season 2, episode 12, In the Name of the Brother. So, in Storybrooke, Captain Hook just got hit by a car. Belle just got shot. Um, what I forgot to mention is that Rumpelstiltskin, or Gold, right as she got shot and lost her memories, he healed her bullet wound with magic. But kind of no one really noticed this, um, but it'll be important later. She just got shot, but she's healed, but she doesn't have her memories. She doesn't even know who she is at all. Like, forget old Storybrooke, Belle forget Enchanted Forest Bell. She just has no memories at all, so that's a different problem. And this man just drove over the town line. Who is this man? This man's name is Greg. There he is. We're gonna put him... We'll go right there. So Greg, a non-Storybrook citizen. He's a non-magical human. He doesn't know about magic, etc, etc. Emma and David as the two sheriffs roll up and bring everyone to the hospital. At the hospital, nobody can find Dr. Whale, and he's clearly in the back room drinking on the job. So now, we get to see a new world, one that we've seen a little bit before. Remember in that episode I hated where uh, Daniel came back to life? Well, now we're back in Frankenstein's world. Remember, this is like our black and white world where Victor Frankenstein creates his monster using an enchanted heart. Um, we're going to see a little bit more of that, so that's our kind of alternate secondary timeline in this episode. We see a flashback of Dr. Frankenstein's world, which again is in black and white. Victor Frankenstein and his brother are celebrating Christmas. And Victor's father, so just pretend we have a little family tree going because I did not put them on the board. Victor's father withdraws financial support from Victor's um, science experiments. Remember, he's Dr. Frankenstein. He is constantly experimenting on people in dark, gloomy castles or whatever you have. Victor's brother kind of tries to talk him off the ledge um, because this is upsetting. Frankenstein's kind of hearing nothing of it until this man rolls up, Rumpelstiltskin, who is the only character in this world shown in color. So imagine everything is black and white until he shows up in his enchanted forest regalia with his magical things and whatever. Back in Storybrooke, Gold visits Belle in the hospital and he tries to give her the kiss of true love to wake her up. Um, for some reason that doesn't work, uh, and she wakes up and she screams because all she sees is a stranger kissing her and I would scream too. So she starts screaming bloody murder and Gold escorts himself out. Meanwhile, a beaten up Hook <laughs> wakes up to Emma and he immediately starts flirting with her. But she hits back with this iconic line, You're awfully chipper for a guy who just tried to kill his enemy, then got run over by a car. I love her. So some of our heroes hack into this man's phone, his name is Greg, and they're freaking out because they've all seen E.T., they've seen Splash, they've seen every movie where a human finds something magical and wants to experiment on it and wants to expose it to the world, and they, who are all magical now, including we got a werewolf, a wizard, I don't know, Snow White, of Snow White fame, they don't want Greg finding out who they are. Also, randomly and alternatively, nobody knows where Regina is. She's been missing since Hopper's supposed death. Nobody's seen her 
since it was revealed that he is alive and that Cora was the one that killed him or kidnapped him. Meanwhile, Dr. Whale is trying to get Gold to heal Greg with magic. But Gold won't do it because Greg has already maybe seen Gold healing Belle and he also um, tried to attack Hook with magic when they were on the town line. So Gold won't risk exposing magic by healing Greg using magic. Back in Frankenstein land, Rumpel rolls up to talk to Victor, and he's interested in Victor's work because Victor's work specifically is bringing people back from the dead. So Rumpel pays Victor like a shit ton of gold coins to continue his scientific work, but Victor needs a body. He needs a body to experiment on. So him and his brother get caught digging a, up a body, and Victor's brother is shot by some, I don't know, British soldier, like some soldier who is protecting the graveyard. You know how that goes like in when you're in London and you're a hungry Victorian boy and there's soldiers everywhere trying to arrest you. That's kind of this vibe. That's actually not this vibe at all. That's a completely different episode. But his brother is shot and killed. Remember, he loves his brother. I don't know if I said that, but just know that. And so now he's like, well, my brother's gone, but what if I kind of brought him back? And so Victor uses his brother's body to experiment on. But as he's doing this, all of the human hearts he uses in this experiment are frying and he realizes he needs one of the enchanted hearts. Remember in the other episode, we already saw him succeed. I think we saw him succeed. We already saw him attempt with an enchanted heart, but this is before that. This is like what draws him to this conclusion that he needs an enchanted heart. Rumpel rolls up again and offers him an enchanted heart and we bring the brother back. Of course, this brother is essentially not human. He is a monster, which I don't think is the point of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. I think the book is over there on the shelf, so maybe I should read it. So, Frankenstein's monster ends up killing their father. So the brother's dead, the father's dead, and Dr. Whale slash Frankenstein has a monster on his hands. In Storybrook, Cora pays Gold a visit. She gives him a magical object that will help him track where Balefire is, because remember, his goal in our world is to find his son. And in exchange, he will help Cora find Regina. Remember, Regina's kind of missing at the moment. Gold agrees to seal the deal the way they used to, and these two kiss. That's a lot, but it calls for some tape, I think. Oh my god. Oh lord. Oh no. So we learn at some point in this timeline, because they're sealing the deal the way they used to, these two had some sort of romance for each other. Great, awesome, love it. You know, the family tree in this show is almost a circle, but they manage to dodge it every time. Meanwhile, Dr. Whale bails on Greg's surgery, because remember, he's drunk. <laughs> so now this whole group chat of Emma, David, Snow, Ruby, and Leroy have to find him. In true general hospital fashion, he is the only one who knows how to do the surgery. Anyway, Henry, finds Regina hanging out in her fancy crypt. This is a very beautiful set that we never see again. Henry tells Regina that she was framed for Archie's death and she's like, oh no shit. I knew I didn't do that, but did you know I didn't do that? Henry turns into Cora. So Cora was shape-shifting to look like Henry. Cora has a little heart-to-heart -heart with Regina and she apologizes for everything she's done. Remember, she was a bad mother. She made Regina um, like go into this, uh, into this marriage with Snow White's father. And Regina's like, listen, if you really want to apologize, prove it and tell everyone that you framed me. Prove that you want to change for me the way I'm changing for Henry. Anyway, Ruby finds Dr. Whale quite literally about to jump into the ocean or something, um, and she catches him. Basically, he's scared that every time he tries to save someone's life, it doesn't work because he didn't, he couldn't really save his brother's life back in Frankenstein land. Ruby gives him a little heart to heart, you know, monster to monster, because her, her whole shtick is that she's a werewolf and she's like, I'm not really a monster, I'm a human on the inside, whatever. And she gives him the whole I ate my boyfriend anecdote and that makes him feel better enough to go sober up and save Greg. Back in Frankenstein's world, Victor, of course, is realizing that his brother is not looking well. He's not doing good. And uh, when Victor goes to kill his creation, which this plotline used to freak me out as a kid, but I kind of really liked this episode on the second time around, but Victor does not kill his brother and he wants to find a way to save him instead. Back in Storybrooke, Whale saves Greg's life and then Emma goes to talk to Greg. He reveals that he was texting and driving when he hit, 
hit Hook. So he didn't see anything. Like he was like, didn't really know kind of what was going on, which to us, of course, that means he didn't see anyone do magic, specifically this man right here. He did not see gold do magic. But when Emma leaves, Greg calls someone and we hear that he did indeed see something strange on the town line. Meanwhile, Gold is trying to get Belle to remember who she is by using the chipped cup that they, you know, is their symbol of love. And she throws it across the room and smashes it. And she's just very upset. She's not having any of this. Gold is upset as if he can't fix the cup himself and he leaves, thank God. Gold then uses this magic globe thing, um, which is what Cora had given him to help him find Bellfire. And it turns out Bellfire is located in New York. At the end of the episode, Henry makes a good point that Dr. Frankenstein is not in the book of fairy tales. Like he's not a once upon a time character. He is a Mary Shelley creation. So how did he become cursed to go to Storybrooke? We don't know. That gets sidelined when Gold comes to their apartment to kind of crash what's going on. Everyone's straight up the entire night trying to keep Greg alive. It was very, it, not General Hospital, what's that show? Grey's Anatomy of them. They were, it was a good episode, I liked it, but it was very Grey's Anatomy of them. They were all trying to save this man's life. Gold is like, I am actually calling in my favor. So remember when Emma helped Cinderella back in season one, which meant that she owed Gold a favor. He's here to cash in the favor. He wants to bring her to help find Balefire in New York, because if she crosses the town line, she won't lose her memories because the rule is that if, if you were in the original curse, you will lose your memories if you cross the town line. So that's everyone except for Emma, Cora, Hook, and Henry, I believe, because they were not part of the original curse. Of course, he was born here, she was sent through the wardrobe, and these two came over later. By the way, I know you guys are gonna yell at me in the comments. During the Tallahassee episode, which is in Florida, um, I did mention that these two were in a romantic relationship and it's heavily implied that Neil is Henry's father, but I completely forgot to like mark that or even draw attention to that. I literally just said, she's a pregnancy test in jail and it's positive. So we're just gonna go with the, the heavy narrative implications that he is Henry's father and I'm gonna update the board now. And I know that like doesn't make sense yet, and it's annoying that I forgot to do it earlier, but please bear with me. So give me a quick second to do that. So heavily narratively implied that Neil, this man right here, the bond, the Clyde from the Bonnie and Clyde act from the Tallahassee episode where they stole a car and stole watches is Henry's father. Season two, episode 13, Tiny. So in Storybrooke, Emma is insisting she take Henry on this trip to find Balefire because Cora is lurking about and of course everyone's weakness is Henry so we don't want Cora getting her hands on Henry in any way shape or form. Meanwhile Regina finds Snow and Charming. They reveal that she was framed for Archie's murder. We're still on this. She's she's a couple episodes behind. She has not been present and Regina seems surprised like she was like oh I didn't know I was framed even though Cora just told her she was framed. So this kind of means she's lying to Snow and Charming. Regina is mad that no one told her Henry was leaving town. This just kind of adds to her arc, to her anger. Meanwhile, Snow and Charming make Hook show them where his ship is. On the ship, they find the giant that Emma defeated at the Beanstalk. I guess the giant that Emma befriended, defeated and then befriended. Anyway, he's a lot tinier now. He's still a pretty big man, but he's not a giant. He's been shrunk down by Cora's magic. When this man, his name is Anton, wakes up, he attacks David, evidently recognizing him from somewhere. And he's like, I won't forget what you did, you'll pay. But David doesn't know what Anton's talking about. Remember, David has a twin brother who looks exactly like him. I know they, they look a lot alike on the board right here, but just trust me on that one. Back in the Enchanted Forest, so we see this giant. Everyone calls him Tiny because he ironically, even though is a giant among our characters here, he's the smallest of the giants. He lives at the top of the beanstalk in the giant palace, you know, like this, like the story, Jack and the Beanstalk. But in true Little Mermaid fashion, he wants to be where the people are. He wants to see the humans that live like on the ground below them because he's fascinated by human relics, all of these things. But all of his brother and father and sister giants are like, no, 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 you have to stay atop the Beanstalk and grow magic beans. Like 
these magic beans need to keep growing. Um, it's just what we do. It's our um, job. But Anton decides to climb down the magic beanstalk to the human realm despite this. Back in Storybrooke, guess who visits Belle in the hospital? Ruby, our favorite girl. Belle is upset because she did see magic. She saw gold attack Hook with like magical fire. And, he, and she also witnessed gold healing her bullet wound, essentially. So she thinks she's crazy because everyone's like, no, magic's not real. I guess they're trying not to freak her out. I don't really know why they're gaslighting her. Like I, we get why they're gaslighting Greg. Not entirely sure why they're gaslighting Belle. <laughs> so remember, she doesn't remember anything. She doesn't know who she is in her cursed self and she doesn't remember her enchanted forest self either. She's just kind of stuck in limbo. Greg overhears this conversation and he's like, you saw magic? Cause I could have sworn I also saw magic. Meanwhile, the Charmings are discussing Tiny and David is like, I don't think I ever did anything to him but you know who might have? My brother James. In the Enchanted Forest, we zoom in on King George telling James, remember the twin brother, to go kill a giant that's been wandering around the kingdom. This giant is Anton. James and his little girlfriend, Jacqueline, who's not on the board. <laughs> Catherine's here, we did not have room for Jacqueline. Does it look like we have room for Jacqueline for a one-off episode? No. Jacqueline, or Jack, goes about befriending Anton by giving him a piece of mushroom that'll make him shrink. Jack and James tell Anton that their kingdom is in debt, and if they don't pay it off, another kingdom will come take over and kind of kill them all. And so Anton's like, hold on, I've got new friends. Let me go get you guys some like gold and treasure and magic beans from my house up in the sky, up in the beanstalk, and you won't be in debt anymore, like as a repayment for taking me in and being my friend. And Jack and James are like, yeah, that sounds great. So when Anton goes back up the beanstalk, the other giants realize that James and Jack have followed with an army and James and Jack lay siege on the beanstalk and use like poison in their um, weapons to kill all of the giants except for Anton. So massive betrayal by this F boy Prince Charming right here. James ends up leaving Jack to die because he's an asshole, we know this. And Anton's dad is also dying, everyone's dying. <laughs> But as Anton's father is dying, he gives Anton the last magic bean and he says, preserve it and find somewhere to grow magic beans again. But um, because Jack and James and their army kind of raised the earth, kind of scorched the earth in this palace on the beanstalk or in this kingdom on the beanstalk, they can't grow the beans there. He'll have to find somewhere else to grow them. But until then, he's got like a bean sprout, a starter bean, a starter pack. Meanwhile, Emma, Gold, and Henry are going through security at the airport. Remember, they're leaving for New York. Gold has to take off his scarf. That is the thing that keeps him from losing his memories. He gets all agitated and Emma covers for him. She's like, listen, my father's a little nervous. We're going to a family reunion. Anyway, the cover works, and even though he's a little woozy, he gets back soon enough. Meanwhile, back in Storybrooke, Regina is in her collab era with Cora, because remember, they've kind of forgiven each other, but they want chaos. So Cora and Regina give Anton a mushroom that will make him grow back to his normal giant size, and they just pretty much tell him to terrorize the town and go kill David, because Anton thinks David is James. When, as this is happening, he's terrorizing the town, Snow and David are like, hey, well, no, 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 you know our daughter, Emma, you gave her the compass, like you trust her. And he's like, well, where's Emma now? And they're kind of like, she's out of town. So that does not help their case at all, but kind of funny. Luckily, Anton's mushroom wears off and he can't kill anyone. He instead falls in a hole, like a crater of his own making or something. And the whole town, because they're good people, rallies to save him. And that's when he realizes, oh wait, maybe humans aren't so bad after all. Maybe it was just Jack and James that screwed me over. Anton remembers that he has a last bean to grow and he's like, do you guys have good like potting soil around here? And they're kind of like, yeah, we do, why? And so he teams up with the dwarves to start growing beans because remember the beans could take them back to the enchanted forest, which has kind of been a through line is that people kind of want to go back to the enchanted forest, especially with Korra on the loose, especially with all this chaos going on. They're kind of like, what if we could go home? And now by growing magic beans, they totally can. The dwarves welcome Anton into their midst and he gets one of those magic pickaxes and it names him Tiny. Season two, episode 14, Manhattan. We open in the enchanted forest. We see Rumpelstiltskin and Mila 
back in their happy marriage era. Rumpelstiltskin is in his pre-Darkwin era, so everyone's happy. Um, Balefire's not born yet, so this is a long time ago. However, Rumpel has been called to fight in the Ogre Wars. See, we've heard the story told verbally. Remember, he gets like read for filth by a guard in season one. We kind of heard it in one of the more recent episodes, um, where Mila, the one where Mila dies, stuff like that. But anyway, he's been called to fight in the Ogre War, and he does not want to be branded a coward because his father was branded a coward and he wants to break the cycle. I got bad news for you, buddy. He wants to fight in the war and does not want to be a coward. Mila's worried because her greatest wish is to have a family. But when Rempel goes to the front, he is made to guard a prisoner. The prisoner is a little girl called a seer, and she sees all. She claims that she can see the future. The girl reveals that Mila is going to have a son, but, quote, Rumpel's actions on the battlefield will leave his son fatherless and he can't do anything to stop it. Back in Manhattan, Emma, Gold, and Henry arrive at an apartment. Emma, remember, she's the one who finds people, finds the correct, correct apartment of the occupant, but the occupant begins to run. Remember, we think the person living in this apartment is Balefire. We've tracked him down, we're gonna find him. Gold makes her go run after him, and she starts a chase through the streets. They're zigzagging through traffic and down alleyways, and Emma manages to intercept him. When she intercepts, the occupant of this apartment, it's none other than Neil from Tallahassee, Florida. <laughs> she demands the truth. She thinks everyone's been playing her. Remember, that was kind of one of our subplots, is that she's just a piece in his game. And whether or not that's true, that remains to be seen. But he explains that Rumpelstiltskin is his father, which means that Neil, Henry's father and Emma's ex-boyfriend, is Balefire. Crazy, I know. He explains that August told him everything and August was the reason that Neil had to betray Emma so she'd go to jail, so eventually she'd come out of jail and go to Storybrooke. But Emma's very upset by this, I would be too. So Neil is Balefire, who is Henry's father. So the, to the people who commented saying that season two and season three were gonna make this board, this closet wall crazy, you're right. Speaking of season three, if you guys like this video, I am completely down to do season three. Um, if you know, you know, this family tree is only gonna get crazier. So big reveal, big reveal. Who saw it coming? I put Balefire and Neil right next to each other on the board, so some of you may have seen it coming. <laughs> Meanwhile, back in Storybrooke, Hook has teamed back up with Cora and Regina, and they begin searching for the Dark One dagger because um, they want to kill him. And now that he's left Storybrooke, um, now that he's left Storybrooke, he does not have magic. In the library, they're looking for a clue to the Dark One dagger, and they find a map that allegedly might lead them to this dagger. Meanwhile, Greg takes a video of Regina doing magic and sends it to some mysterious woman. Send it, sends it to someone named, um, like her in his contact list. In the Enchanted Forest, Rumpel, remember he's been drafted to fight in the Ogre War, is about to go on the front lines when he sees all the injured people coming back. And everyone's like, well, being injured is kind of better than dying. He's like, well, if my actions will leave my son fatherless, like I might as well get injured and get sent home instead of die. Like maybe he's trying to avoid the seer's fate. So he starts panicking and instead of riding into battle, he takes a huge mallet and uses it to break his leg so he gets sent home, and to this day, we still see him using a cane. So his actions on the battlefield not only eventually did leave Neil fatherless, but also scarred him for life. Rumpel returns home to Mila having given birth to Balefire. However, the village has already gotten the tea. The village has already branded Rumpel a coward for hurting himself to get away from the Ogre Wars. So Rumpel did not escape his father's fate of also being a coward. Back in Manhattan, Emma's panicking because she wants to protect Henry. Do you remember when Emma lied to Henry about who his dad was? Back in season one, there's a point where Emma says, oh, your dad was a firefighter and he died in a fire as a hero. That was clearly a lie because his father's right there, but Henry does not know this. She has to decide if she's gonna reveal the truth about everything. Emma then goes back, she lies to Gold and says that his son got away. Gold then breaks into Neil's apartment anyway, and when he realizes Emma's hiding something, he demands the truth from Emma, he starts to kind of threaten her, but Neil bursts in and puts a stop to it because nobody hurts Emma on his watch. Gold realizes they know each other. 
Henry bursts in and panics and he's like, mom, what's going on? And Neil's like, do I have a son? Remember, Neil does not know that Emma was ever pregnant. Neil does not know anything. Neil does not know Henry exists. So Neil does the math. Henry's 10. And what did we do 10 years ago? Henry, on the other hand, realizes that Emma lied to him about who his father is. It's so nice to have the family together for dinner. Harold! Shrek! Fiona! Fiona! Mom! Harold! Dante! Meanwhile, Rumpel, or Gold, offers to bring Neil to Storybrooke and start over by using magic to, like, literally reset Neil's age. And Neil is like, why the hell would I want that? Magic is what got us into this shit in the first place. Why would any of it be fixed using magic? Like, that's just such a bad idea. He's still pissed because he's like, why, after all these years, you worked so hard to find me, and yet all of your solutions are still about using magic. Harold, Shrek, Fiona, Fiona, Mom, Harold, Dante. Neil won't talk to Gold because he's still angry about being abandoned as a child around Henry's age. So instead, Neil goes to meet his son and they have a cute little father-son heart-to-heart. And it goes well, considering the circumstances. Back in the Enchanted Forest, Rumpel, there's been a time skip, he is now the Dark One. And he finds the seer again, she's all grown up and she's like a woman now, still a seer. He blames her for the series of events that led to Balefire falling in the portal, because remember the seer was like, this fate is unavoidable, your actions will leave him fatherless, and she was right. He asks her how to find him again, and she's like, it's possible, but only if you cast a dark curse that will rip everyone from this land and set you all in a different land. And so this is where the first seeds of the dark storybook curse come into play. She can't give him any more information, but he's like, well, if I kill you, I'll have your power to see the future. And she's like, okay, go for it. So when he kills her with the seer's last breaths, she tells him that a boy will lead Rumpel to his son, and this boy will be Rumpel's undoing. Remember that. Obviously, this boy is Henry. So then Rumpel gets the power to see the future, but of course, it's much more of a curse than it is a blessing. He sees too much, he knows too much, and you know what? Maybe he's a little crazy because of it. Season two, episode 15, The Queen is Dead. In the Enchanted Forest, we zoom in on a young Snow White played by Bailey Madison of Wizards of Waverly Place fame. She is getting ready for her birthday ball. We get to meet Snow's mother, whose name is Ava, with an E, not with an A. I can't have it all, but Snow's mother's name is Ava. So this is Snow's father. He's over here because he married Regina. This is Snow's mother. So theoretically they're married. This is so messed up. It's always her. Every time I panic, it's because of her. I want to commit to the bit, but okay. So I put the purple tape here. But these two are clearly married and in love, like they have to be married. But I don't really have enough room for more pink tape. I mean, I guess I could... So these two are married, but they're on opposite sides of the schism. This is awful. Okay, so you guys are in on this. But, ready? And then, uh-huh, oh. Recreating this for season three is gonna be one hell of a task. Okay. Okay, this is not as going this is not going as bad as I thought it would be. Snow's mother has raised Snow to be loving and kind, and Snow's mother gives her like a tiara for her birthday or whatever. However, on her birthday, the queen, Ava, starts to become very ill, and we all know what that means. Johanna, their servant, who I don't have a picture of, but for some reason I have a picture of the queen. Oh, oops. Suggests that maybe magic can save the queen if they ask the blue fairy for help. Back in Storybrooke, David is trying to convince Snow to celebrate her birthday. She receives an anonymous gift. It's the tiara from her mother, and she thinks, or she kind of knows, the tiara was sent by Johanna, and she didn't even know Johanna was in Storybrooke. She goes to find Johanna, who is planting a garden in um, Queen Ava's honor, because Queen Ava ends up dying, spoiler alert, we all know this. But as she's doing so, um, Snow stumbles upon Regina and Cora digging digging up where they think Gold's Dagger is. Remember, they found a map that allegedly led them to Gold's Dagger. By the way, during all of this, they kind of sidelined Hook and kind of abandoned him. So Hook is once again off on his own, betrayed for the millionth time. 
So Snow overhears their conversation and realizes that they are trying to get the dagger to kill Rumpelstiltskin, or at least control him. Meanwhile, Hook attacks David and steals his hook back. It was being kept at the sheriff's station. Snow finds David, helps him. You know, he's been knocked out, but everyone's fine. They hatch a plan to take advantage of the fact that Regina doesn't fully trust Cora. Because remember, Cora is kind of a baddie and not in a good way. Snow confronts Regina, and she says all Cora wants is power. She doesn't actually care about Henry, because remember, Regina's goal is to kind of do whatever it takes to get back Henry. I feel like she kind of gave up on the changing for him thing now that she's working with her mother again, but I digress. Back in Manhattan, Neil and Henry are getting along great. Unfortunately, Henry and Neil are both mad at Emma and Gold, respectively. <laughs> Gold convinces, or Gold wants Emma to convince Neil to come back to Storybrooke with them. Then, Hook rolls up, tries to stab Rumpelstiltskin. Now let's pause. I know you have a couple questions. One, how the hell did Hook get to New York from Maine? He took his ship, the Jolly Roger. Two, why didn't he lose his memories when crossing the town line? Well, remember, these two didn't come over with the original curse, so they're under the same qualifier as Emma and Henry in the fact that they won't lose their memories when they cross the town line. Emma knocks Hook out again. Neil knows Hook personally. Write that down. They know each other. Anyway, Gold is hurt. They kind of have to nurse him back to health because remember, nobody quite, nobody has magic outside of Storybrooke. Gold has been poisoned, and so they have to get him back to Storybrooke fast. And the only way to get there is to steal Take, because he's knocked out. They put him in a closet. They just kind of left him there. Not sure why you would do that. Don't know why they didn't take... Uh, it does not matter. They take Hook's ship, and they sail it back to Storybrooke. Weirdly, Neil knows exactly how to man a ship, how to drive, how to work a pirate ship. And not just any ship. He knows the inner workings of this ship specifically. That'll come into play later. David and Snow call Emma with the dagger news, saying that these two want the dagger, the Dark One dagger. They need to get Gold to tell them where it is. Um, and Gold tells them that it's in the clock tower. So these two rush to the clock tower to try and get the dagger before Cora and Regina. Just as Snow and David roll up to the clock tower, Regina and Cora roll up with Johanna, the servant, and Snow's friend and pretty much are kind of like, if you don't give us the dagger, we will kill Johanna. And so, of course, being the heroes they are, Snow and David give Cora and Regina the dagger in return for Johanna's life. But then Cora kills Johanna anyway, so that is awful. That sucks. Back in the Enchanted Forest, young Snow asks the Blue Fairy for help. The Blue Fairy says only dark magic can prevent her mother from dying, because remember, that's our goal is to stop Queen Ava from dying. And so the Blue Fairy gives Snow a candle that will save her mother's life. But the price for using this candle that, uh, that can save someone is that it'll have to kill someone else in return. Snow refuses to do it, but unfortunately that means Snow's mother dies. Let's put the candle on the board because that's going to be important. After Snow's mother's funeral, the Blue Fairy rolls up. She turns into Cora. So Snow wasn't actually talking to the Blue Fairy at all. Cora was just disguised as her. Cora monologues to Snow's mother's dead body for a minute. She seems to have personally known Snow's mother from the way that she talks. It's revealed that it was Cora who poisoned her and her goal, whoa, Cora's goal, and Cora's goal is to blacken Snow's heart and get revenge at Snow and put Regina on the throne. I had to think that through for a minute. We've got a lot of villains with a lot of motivations. Back in Storybrooke, Cora reveals to Snow, because Snow never knew that Cora killed her mother, but Cora reveals this information and then subsequently kills Johanna, leaving Snow very upset, very upset, very sad, <laughs> whatever. Snow spirals, wondering how many good people are going to die if the heroes continue to play by their own rules and not the convoluted, immoral, rules of the villains. The Manhattan crew get their asses to the Jolly Roger, but on the way, they run into Neil's fiance, Tamara. There's Tamara. She's serving as always. Season 2, episode 16, The Miller's Daughter. In the Enchanted Forest, we zoom in on what looks like a mill. We see a very young Cora and her father running the mill. She has to deliver flour to the castle as part of, you know, her being a peasant, her being a miller. 
When she delivers flour to the castle, we meet Princess Ava of the Northern Kingdom, who has come to kind of entertain the prince, to get to know the prince. But Princess Ava is very rude. She's very stuck up. Um, clearly she did some character growth before she became Snow White's kind mother. Right now she's a bitch. And she's quite mean to Cora, spills all the flour, classic bullying. In Storybrooke, the Manhattan crew fly the Jolly Roger, the ship. They're all having this realization that they're family now. Gold is Henry's grandfather and Emma feels like she has to save him because remember, he's still dying from the poison. But the main problem now is that Cora and Regina have the dagger that can control the Dark One. Meanwhile, Cora wants to kill Gold with the knife and become the new Dark One and take his power. Regina's kind of like, that wasn't the plan. We were going to either dispose of Gold or control him. Like, nobody was taking anyone's power. And Cora's kind of like, mm, but what if? But like, what if I did that? And she realizes that if Cora kills Gold, Henry will never forgive her. In the Enchanted Forest, Cora attends a masquerade ball at the palace undercover, but she's immediately recognized by the king, who is, I guess at that point would be Snow White's grandfather. Anyway, the king in this scenario is Ava's father-in-law? He's not incredibly important. The king does not like her, and he like puts her down because she's a peasant because she's a miller's daughter, and she's like, actually, you shouldn't talk down to me because I can spin straw into gold. She just comes up with this lie on the fly. And everyone's kind of like, prove it. So the king holds her to that by locking her in a tower filled with straw. If she spins it into gold, she will be allowed to marry the prince. Cora, in the tower for the night, despairs because she can't actually spin straw into gold. Luckily, Rumpelstiltskin appears and he's like, hey, I'm a sorcerer and that's actually my specialty, spinning straw into gold. In return for her firstborn child, Cora's firstborn child, Rumpelstiltskin will spin all this straw into gold and allow, which will allow Cora to marry the prince. Does this make sense? If you're familiar with the story, the original Brothers Grimm story of Rumpelstiltskin, that's kind of how it goes. In exchange for her firstborn child, he will spin all the straw into gold. Remember, Rumpel sees the future now and he knows that Cora's firstborn child will be very important. Cora, on the other hand, does not want that. She does not take the deal. Instead, she wants Rumpel to teach her how to spin straw into gold. And so they agree. Back in Storybrooke, Snow, after the death of Johanna, after this realization that Cora killed her mother, is intent on killing Cora. David tries to talk her out of it. He wants Snow to keep her heart pure. This is a new concept. Apparently, if you kill someone, your heart is darkened and it is no longer pure, which seems weird, but whatever. As they're getting ready to face off Cora, Gold leads Snow to finding that same candle that she could have used to save her mother. He wants her to use the candle and she's kind of down. She's down for murder <laughs> at this point. But however, they need to find Cora's heart because they need her heart to use it. Basically what they have to do is they have to put, they have to curse Cora's heart, put it inside Cora's chest and then use the candle. And remember, Cora does not keep her heart inside of her because she is the queen of hearts. Snow is unsure about this, but when Regina and Cora attack, Snow sneaks out to find Cora's heart. Remember, these two are attacking with the Dark One dagger. That's where we're at. She takes Cora's heart, curses it, and tricks Regina into putting her heart back in Cora's body. And remember, Cora has always been heartless. Have you read that book by Marissa Meyer? It's pretty good. When her heart gets put back in her body, she kind of begins to feel all of the love that she should have been feeling for Regina this entire time, but because she never had a heart, she couldn't. This is an inconsistent plot point. Sometimes people don't have hearts in the show and they're fine. They're perfectly loving, but sometimes they don't have hearts and they're evil and heartless and that's just some inconsistencies. So re she realizes that this Cora, who is loving, has love, could have been the mother that Regina needed all along. And it's kind of like, holy shit, like, I have a mother now. But then of course, Cora immediately dies because Snow cursed Cora's heart and Cora's dead. Meanwhile, Gold, who is dying, calls Belle, even though she does not remember him. And this is kind of sweet. With his dying breaths, he tries to remind her who she is. He's like, you're good and you're kind and you're someone who brings out the good in people even though they don't necessarily deserve it. Neil overhears this conversation of Gold actually having true feelings for someone and being kind. And he kind of reconsiders his stance on his father, and he begins to forgive gold just a little. Back in the Enchanted Forest, Cora learns to spin straw into gold, and the prince proposes to her. 
But Cora and Rumple have kind of fallen in love during this. Remember, they, they are sealing the deal with their kisses. That's what's going on. So instead of becoming a princess, she wants to run away and live with Rumpelstiltskin. And when I say becoming a princess, maybe this is a different kingdom. For some reason, becoming a princess won't give her the power she wants. She'll be like seventh in line for the throne and she wants to be queen. I don't know how that works because remember as she grows up, her goal is to get Regina on the throne, which means that she never got on the throne herself, but she was still a princess at one point. I'm not entirely sure. At this point, he had changed their contract so that she does not owe her firstborn child. He owes her their child together. She does not want this. She wants revenge on the king who was kind of awful to her. So she goes to the king and rips out his heart. But instead of, um, I think, killing him, she rips out her own heart so she can't feel love for Rumpel or anyone. This is kind of the genesis of her ripping out her own heart, not feeling love for anyone. So she ends up going to marry the prince that is not the prince. I'm getting confused. I kept pointing at him as if he was the prince. I'm confused. She marries someone else, but then Queen Ava, wait, Queen Ava, wait, so if, okay. So if Queen Ava bullied her and Queen Ava was the one that was gonna marry this guy because they ended up having snow and then she died. And so then Regina married this man Cora could not have also married this man, which means there's a third prince in the mix. Somehow she marries someone that puts her in like seventh in line for the throne. Okay, it's so confusing, but I figured it out. Cora marries this man right here, who has been fully been on the board this entire time, um, but I was confused. So she marries him. He is not that great though, because he's seventh in line to the throne. So Cora and Princess Ava were kind of vying over him. And even though Cora wins and marries him, uh, it's still not that great. Princess Ava later on goes on to marry Snow's father and they eventually have Snow. So that's the connection there. It's a little, a little dicey, a little confusing. Maybe it's the prince of another kingdom. Maybe Ava was just scoping out her options and didn't actually marry the prince in this episode. Maybe this is a different kingdom than Snow's kingdom. Does that make any sense? I'm so distressed. Please comment down below if you understood that. Yeah, she definitely could not have married him because he would have been her son-in-law. Oh my God, this family tree is a circle. Oh my gosh. Whatever, she marries someone at the end of the day and has Regina. He's literally right there and he's been there this entire time. I don't know why I was so confused. Maybe I have to go with the theory that she was just entertaining this prince and didn't end up marrying him because Cora ended up marrying him. But that still didn't give her enough power to get Regina on the throne without killing Ava. Maybe this will be explained in season three. I don't remember. Back in Storybrooke, Snow is feeling instant regret for tricking Regina. So Cora dies and Regina immediately realizes what Snow did. And that's the end of that episode. Season two, episode 17, Welcome to Storybrooke. We open somewhere random in Maine, in the middle of the woods, and we meet a son and a father who are sitting around a campfire making these like latchkey keychains that I definitely made at summer camp, but I don't remember what they're called. When suddenly a storm comes in, let me put the father and son on the board. Their names are Kurt and Owen. I think I might have to move. Kurt and Owen. So Kurt and Owen are just camping, minding their own business when they get caught in this haze of purple smoke. When they leave their campsite, they stumble across a town that they could have sworn was not there before. This town is called Storybrook. It's as if someone dropped Storybrooke right on top of them. And they walk into town. It's clearly a flashback because guess who shows up? Our bestie Graham. Now, I need to take a minute because I've been humbled. I've been checked. I've been checked in the comments below by a lovely commenter. I spent two and a half hours calling this man, Jamie Dornan, Scottish Christian Grey, when in fact, he is not Scottish. He is indeed Northern Irish. Shout out to the commenter who informed me of this so politely and so kindly and in such a funny way. And I'll just put the comment up here. It was just, I laughed out loud. I do feel bad. 
I am so sorry to Northern Ireland and Scotland for the mix-up. So Northern Irish Christian Grey rolls up and welcomes them to Storybrooke. In this Storybrooke fa flashback, we see Regina wake up, and we're kind of realizing this is the first day of the Storybrooke curse. She wakes up and she sees this perfect town that she's the mayor of. Nobody knows who they are. Snow White is named Mary Margaret and she's a school teacher. This man is named John Doe and he's in a coma. Even Gold doesn't know who he is. Like she is just kind of over the moon, like my curse worked. She goes around meeting all of the characters, but she also meets Kurt and Owen who've rolled up. And she doesn't like this because she doesn't know them from the Enchanted Forest. In the story, Brooke, in the present, not in the past, Regina has to bury Cora for real this time. Um, and she is intent on killing Snow for what Snow did to Cora. Meanwhile, Snow is depressed and in bed. Gold comes by to warn them that Regina wants to kill Snow again. David makes Gold protect them because Gold owes Snow a life debt for saving his life. So the shtick about the candle is the only reason he didn't die is because she saved his life by killing Cora. That is why he wanted her to use the candle because the candle works, you have to kill someone in order to save someone else's life. So David is like, no, you owe us a life debt. You tricked Snow into this. In the past, Regina ensures that Kurt and Owen get their car fixed so they can leave. And in return, the little boy gives her that like latch key thing that he made. Regina then wakes up the next day and essentially relives the entire day, minus these two. They're just, everyone else is kind of frozen, doing the same thing over and over. Mary Margaret is walking to school. Gold is just in a shop. Everyone's doing the same thing over and over again. She starts to realize that it's a little boring being the queen of a town where no one knows who you are. Regina realizes she has nothing to challenge her anymore. She's not happy. This wasn't necessarily the deal she made. The deal she made is that something would be real and she would get real revenge, and instead she's just stuck in this frozen time loop. She goes to Gold, but of course Gold doesn't remember anything. He's like, I don't know what deal you're talking about. In the present, Regina is going through all this grief when she finds a spell on a scrap of paper. Gold puts the pieces together and realizes that Regina has found a spell that will make Henry love her. That's her new goal, is to just make Henry love her in any way possible, apparently. Gold reveals that this curse to make Henry love her needs the heart of the person Regina hates the most, and that is Snow White. Meanwhile, Henry is still mad at Emma, so she brings him to talk to Neil. Neil offers to take Henry back to New York, but Henry runs away instead. Because they want to protect Henry from Cora, from Regina. No, Cora's dead. They want to protect Henry from Regina. <laughs> Henry's plan is to take the dynamite. He found dynamite in the mines for some reason. And he wants to blow up the well where all of the curses come through. At this point, the well should probably be on the board. I don't know. This episode is a little mishmash. I don't know who wrote it because they sped, they sped up this idea that Henry can even destroy magic by destroying a well, which is not even how it works, I don't think. But anyway, he wants to destroy magic, which I guess is the right idea because magic is what gets everyone into these tussles in the first place. Regina goes to try and talk Henry out of blowing up a well with dynamite and she's like that won't that won't allow you to get rid of magic henry tries to talk regina out of casting casting the curse that will make him love her because uh he's making the argument that magic is ruining everyone it you know ruined mary margaret she's now a murderer of course it ruined gold it ruined everything you know what he's right he's right in the past regina invites kurt and owen over for dinner Owen, this 10 year old, is the only one who kind of challenges Regina and gives her a run for her money, essentially. And he also tells Regina that she would make a good mom. And she's like, oh, I would. Regina takes a liking to Owen, the kid. And she asks these two if they want to move to Storybrooke and they're both like, no. So when they try and leave, Regina, remember she used to control Graham's heart back when he was alive? She uses Northern Irish Christian Grey's heart to force him to arrest these two. And honestly, for Kurt and Owen, this episode is kind of a horror film. Like, imagine there was a town that came out of nowhere. For some reason, this entire plotline is under like a beige filter. So not only are you in a town, but you're, it's filters. The editor filtered it all beige. And then you meet a woman who takes a liking to your son who wants to keep him. And then the weird, and then at the town line, Graham and Regina catch Kurt, the father, and they arrest him. 
and Kurt tells Owen to run away in the woods. Yeah, Kurt tells Owen to run away in the woods, and Owen leaves, and that's the end of their story, is that Kurt gets arrested and Owen runs away. Owen later returns with state troopers, but nobody can find Storybrook, Maine again. Remember, before the curse was broken, nobody can enter Storybrook. The only reason they were there is because the curse got dropped on top of them. So the state troopers, of course, don't believe that there was a town here. But Owen knows there was, and he vows to find his dad and to find Storybrook again. Back in the present, the guilt of being a murderer is eating at Snow, and Snow goes to Regina, begging Regina to end Snow's life. Regina knows that Henry would never forgive her if she killed Snow, so instead she rips out Snow's heart and shows the little bit of black, because her heart becomes black, because she's a murderer. She shows Snow the bit of black heart, just kind of as a fun fact, as a way of making her feel worse about herself. Now, who films this interaction? None other than Greg. And what does Greg have on his keychain? One of those little latchkey things. This episode ends with Greg vowing to find his dad. So Greg is Owen. Nice. We're, we're cooking with fire now. Season 2, episode 18, Selfless, Brave, and True. We open in Thailand in 2011 to find August. He wakes up at 8.15 a.m. He jolts out of bed, and his leg is beginning to turn to wood for what looks like the first time. Remember last season, the way he got Emma to believe... No, the way he tried to get Emma to believe was that his leg was turning into wood because he did a bad job of helping her break the curse, essentially. Right? Do we understand? But anyway, he's in Thailand on a random day, and his leg starts to turn to wood, and he realizes that means Emma has found Storybrook for the first time. Back in Storybrook, David is trying to make Snow feel better, but Emma thinks they should stop coddling her, and that Snow is the only one can get her, that can get herself out of this grief and guilt. Snow over, overhears this, and she decides to go for a walk in the woods incredible transition she like has her bow and arrow in the woods and is listening to like hard rock music to i don't know just hype herself up and she's just doing some archery when she stumbles across what looks like an old camper van who is in the camper van but august who is completely wooden he did not turn back into a man when emma broke the curse last season he stayed wooden <laughs> august thinks that turning into wood is not the dark curse at all but it's his own punishment by the blue fairy because the reason she was able to turn him into a real boy was if he stayed selfless, brave, and true. And he did not do that because he abandoned his kind of principles and he did not help Emma break the curse in the way that he was supposed to, which means he is now kind of cursed himself to turn back into wood. Meanwhile, Neil tells Emma that his fiance Tamara is on her way to Storybrook. Emma freaks out because Tomorrow does not know the truth about who anyone is, let alone who Neil is, that he's the son of Rumpelstiltskin, that she's the daughter of Snow White and Prince Charming. Emma meets Tamara, and it's not awkward. It's just a little awkward. Neil tries to tell Tamara the truth about being from the Enchanted Forest because, like, they're gonna get married. Like, she needs to know the truth if this is all gonna work out. But, um, and he even gives her the storybook to look through. But of course she does not believe him. In fact, she thinks there's something still going on between Neil and Emma. In Hong Kong in 2011, August is at an emergency room to get his leg checked out, but the doctor does not see anything. And he's like, my leg is wood. And the doctor is like, you're crazy. No one believes him, but this random guy who's kind of like, I know someone who can fix you. August goes to see this guy called the dragon who can allegedly heal wounds using magic. Guess who's also there to see the dragon? Tamara. August goes in to see the dragon, and the dragon knows exactly who he is, that he is Pinocchio. And the dragon says he can fix August's leg if August gives him something of great value. The dragon's price is the string that Geppetto first used to animate Pinocchio as a puppet, but then he, uh, the dragon also demands $10,000, and August does not have $10,000. You know who does have $10,000? Tamara, in her wallet, happens to have $10,000. So, he just kind of finds Tamara at a bar. They're chit-chatting. She's like, yeah, you know, uh, the dragon cured my cancer, stuff like that. I'm having a great time. He needed a picture of my grandmother and some money. And so I gave him the picture of my grandmother and some money and he cured my cancer. And August is like, no way, that's crazy. 
he steals when she like goes out to the bathroom or something he steals the money from the wallet and runs back to the dragon the dragon gives him a potion to drink to cure his leg but tomorrow follows him they give chase through hong kong he loses the potion to her back in storybrook tamara finds august and she confronts him of course she believes in magic because the dragon healed her after all so she the, we don't so i guess we don't know why she didn't believe neil because we also learn that she does believe in magic so something fishy is going on with tamara something weird she will give august the potion that she stole back in hong kong in return for august to leave storybrook and never come back august realizes that she is neil's fiance because he kind of heard tell that neil's fiance was in town but tamara confirms that neil doesn't know that she knows about magic so again something fishy is going on meanwhile greg has been putting around town and regina is kind of like why do you look so familiar it doesn't take her long now that we know he's owen it does not take her long to realize that he is owen he confronts her because he wants to know where his father is but regina says she doesn't know she doesn't remember she didn't pay attention that was a long time ago Meanwhile, Emma, Snow, and Geppetto, Pinocchio's father, are on their way to find August because Snow told them about August hiding out in the trailer. Geppetto reveals to Snow the lie that the wardrobe actually had enough magic to transport to. So remember, when Emma got transported, Geppetto told everyone that the wardrobe could only take one person. But that wasn't the truth. The wardrobe could actually take two, and he sent Pinocchio along with Emma. And he's like, Snow, I'm so sorry. I separated, I ruined your life. I separated you from your daughter. Because uh, Snow didn't know any of this. Nobody really knew this. He apologizes and Snow hits him across the face. And immediately she's like, I'm so sorry. I don't know where that came from. And she forgives him. Um, but it's as if something evil and mean overcame her in that moment. Luckily, she does forgive him. Back in Hong Kong, Tamara confronts the dragon and wants to know about the magic he uses to cure people. When he confirms that it is magic, apparently that is all she needs, she kills him. So he dies and she runs away. But this confirms that Tamara just knows magic, I guess. On his way out of Storybrook, August realizes that Tamara is kind of a fraud person trying to steal magic because he'd found the dragon dead back in Hong Kong and realizes she killed him. When he confronts her, she tasers him, um, and the taser is really powerful, apparently, powerful enough to kill him. Um, Emma and the heroes find him, and he is trying to warn them that Tamara wants to steal magic. That is her whole shtick. So he's like, she's dangerous, and Emma's like, who's dangerous? Who is dangerous? And he dies, but before he can die, the blue fairy turns him back into a little boy. No way. But as little boy Pinocchio, August doesn't remember what he was trying to warn them about. Emma. Meanwhile, apologizes to Henry for never telling him about his dad, and she promises to never lie to Henry again. Henry forgives her, and Snow, on the other hand, tells David that her heart has started to blacken, and she's worried that redemption isn't possible. Back in New York in 2011, remember August and Neil kind of made the plan to put Emma in jail to get her to go to Storybrooke later? They're chit-chatting, and August thinks him turning to wood means that Emma is in Storybrooke. Essentially, this is the scene where August realizes he has to get to Storybrooke to get Emma to break the curse. So they're talking, and so he says goodbye, like, good luck getting Emma to break the curse. I send my best regards, send me a postcard when the curse is broken. He's like, yeah, sure. He leaves on his motorbike when Tamara, who's overheard this entire thing, runs into Neil and spills coffee all over him, which begins the start of their friendship, which becomes a relationship, which becomes an engagement. In Storybrooke, Greg gets a visit from none other than Tamara. They seem to know each other. In fact, they start making out. And that is the end of the episode. Season two, episode 19, Lacey. In Storybrooke, it is Henry's birthday. We are celebrating with all of our heroes in Mr. Gold's shop. Gold says that Henry can pick out any one item in the shop as a birthday present. When Henry picks out a magic wand, it turns him into glass. Gold explains to everyone who is looking on this horrified that the seer said that Henry will be Gold's undoing. Right before Gold hits Henry with his cane to shatter him, Gold wakes up. It was all a dream. In fact, it was a nightmare. 
Gold goes to visit Belle in the hospital. She is surprised he's alive. He made a phone call to her while he was dying and she thinks that he's dead. But she's like, oh no, you're alive, great. Anyway, they have a little bonding moment and Belle asks him, because remember after this phone call, she's like, maybe you're not such a bad guy after all. Belle asks him to help her remember who she is. Before Belle can get discharged from the hospital, Regina visits her and Regina drop drops on accident a little matchbook that's been enchanted. And this matchbook allows Belle to remember who she is, more or less. In the Enchanted Forest, remember when Rumpelstiltskin kidnapped Belle? You remember that? And she was his servant? We flash back to right after she got kidnapped. She's still in her yellow dress. She hasn't even changed into her pretty blue dress yet. And she is pretty upset about being kidnapped. She's sobbing. Someone breaks into Rumpel's castle and tries to steal a magic wand. It's a guy named Robin Hood. Also not on the board, guys. I'm, I'm dropping the ball with some of these characters, but it looks like there's so many on here. Whatever. Robin Hood breaks into the castle and steals a magic wand. Before he can get away with it, Rumpel catches him and takes him prisoner and begins to torture him. Things do not bode well for people who steal from the Dark One. Back in Storybrooke, Tamara and Greg, they're... Apparently they've known each other the whole time. They're in cahoots for this whole destroying magic thing. You know, that whole thing. Because they... Don't, he doesn't like Regina, she just wants to destroy magic. We're not entirely sure why. They keep talking about this package they're bringing to Storybrooke. Meanwhile, remember those beans that Anton started growing a couple episodes ago? Well, Snow and David show Emma the beans. Emma didn't really know this was happening. She was too busy being in New York. And um, Emma realizes that Snow and David want to use the beans to go back to the Enchanted Forest. They want to fix the Enchanted Forest, drive out the ogres, all of that. Emma does not exactly want this. She didn't have the greatest time in the Enchanted Forest, either time she was there. Back in the Enchanted Forest, Rumble is torturing Robin Hood. As you do, Belle protests against this. Remember, she is good. She brings out the good in people. That's her whole shtick. And she tries to defend Robin Hood, saying that maybe he was stealing the wand for a good reason. She says, you can't tell what's in a person's heart unless you truly know them. When Rumple leaves, she frees Robin Hood and lets him escape. Rumple is incredibly angry, especially because when Robin Hood escaped, he stole the wand anyway. Rumple makes Belle go with him to hunt down and kill Robin Hood. Meanwhile, in Storybrooke, Belle discharges herself from the hospital and Gold finds her at a bar, like a, like a dive bar, like kind of like a icky, you know, low, low life, not really, but like a place to be that Belle wouldn't, a place that Belle herself would not probably go to. Belle has transformed back into her cursed self, a girl named Lacey, who is the complete opposite of Belle. So remember, Belle crossed the town line, forgot everything, and now remembers that she is her pre-cursed self. Lacey is the opposite of Belle. She is mean and rude, and she smokes, and she drinks, and she's a bad girl, and she hustles guys at pool, and she's just not very kind, not very Belle. And so Gold is thrown by this. Gold knows the only thing that can fix Lacey, because her name is now Lacey, is true love's kiss. So Gold actually goes to David for dating advice, and David helps him out by telling them that Belle needs to see the Rumpelstiltskin she fell in love with, like the good side of Rumpelstiltskin. Gold asks Lacey out on a date, and Lacey is surprised because she's known that Gold has a reputation for doing awful things, and she's like, I don't know if I want to date you. Also, you're being weirdly kind for someone who has such a bad reputation. She remarks, but I guess you can't tell what's in a person's heart until you truly know them. Despite this little convo, during the date, Lacey sneaks out the bathroom and back to the bar. In the Enchanted Forest, Rumpel and Belle find Robin Hood, who is using the magic wand to cure his wife, who is pregnant and sick. Belle was right, he stole the wand for a good reason. Belle tries to talk to Rumpel out of killing Robin Hood with the whole, I know you, there's good in you speech, we've heard it a thousand times, we're gonna hear it a thousand more times. Rumpel goes to shoot this arrow at Robin Hood anyway. He's using an enchanted bow that never misses his target. But when he goes to shoot the arrow, it misses his target. And Robin Hood gets away. Belle knows that had to have been on purpose. And um, she's quite proud of him for doing this. And so when they get back to the castle, kind of as a thank you for bringing out the best in him, he gifts her the library. You know, the iconic Beauty and the Beast scene where Belle sees the library. Cute, fun. I don't know if that would quite make up for things, if it was me. Back in Storybrooke, 
Gold finds Lacey making out with a rando in an alleyway and Gold chases him off. Lacey's upset because she's like, what the hell? Like, I don't know you. You have no right to be chasing off the boys I make out with. Gold beats up this random person. And this kind of impresses Lacey, this kind of violent side of him. Lacey sees this and she's kind of into it. She likes the darkness. Meanwhile, Regina has been suspicious that something's been going on with the dwarves. Remember, she doesn't know about the beans. She follows the Charmings as they like go check on the beans. The beans are cloaked by magic so that Regina and Cora couldn't find them, but Regina finds them anyway. And she begins to put the pieces together that they are going back to the Enchanted Forest and they're probably not gonna invite her. We see Greg and Tamara bringing the package to Storybrooke. The package is a big trailer with Captain Hook like tied up in it. So that sucks for him. <laughs> he just keeps getting thrown around as he should. Love this season for him, obsessed with this for him. Season two, episode 20, The Evil Queen. Tamara and Greg offer Hook a job. Hook thought he killed Gold back in New York with the poison dagger, but Tamara and Greg are like, no, you actually failed that again. And in return for like letting Hook kill Gold, I guess, Greg asks Hook to help him find his father. I'm not entirely sure. Meanwhile, Charming and Snow decide to give Regina a choice. When they go back to the Enchanted Forest with the beans, Regina can either stay in Storybrooke or go back to the Enchanted Forest and stay in Rumpel's cell, the where he was captured. Regina does not like this, and she tells Henry and Charming that Snow and that David don't want her back at the Enchanted Forest at all. She assures Henry that she wants to go back and start over and kind of become a hero and not a villain. She tells Henry that there is essentially a self-destruct button that will make Storybrooke disappear and kill everyone, but Regina and Henry can go back to the Enchanted Forest together instead of being destroyed. So, of course, Henry doesn't like this and refuses to work with her. She erases his memory so he doesn't remember anything about this conversation. In the Enchanted Forest in the past, Regina is reigning her reign of terror. She's looking for Snow White. So she's the evil queen. She's looking for Snow White, who is on the run. She is threatening all of the extras, like extras, tell me where Snow is. And when she, the extras or the villagers don't tell her, she kills them all. She kills an entire village who refuses to tell her where Snow White is. Regina goes to Rumpelstiltskin for help, adamant that Rumpel help her shapeshift so she can kind of go undercover and figure out where Snow is. Rumpel agrees and turns her into like um, kind of an old maid, like not super old, but just so that she's unrecognizable in order to trick Snow, as long as Regina cuts off all trade to King George's realm. It's a whole thing. We don't need to hear about the economics of the situation. Disguised as an old maid, she learns that the kingdom hates her and loves Snow White, but uh, when she tries to stand up for herself as the queen, the guards don't recognize her because she's unrecognizable. They go to execute her because they don't know she's the queen. She, they think she's just some rando but she is saved by none other than Snow White, who also doesn't recognize her. Back in Storybrooke, Hook pays a visit to Regina, saying that he wants to make an alliance with her. Regina agrees to let him in on her plan to destroy Storybrooke, and she brings Hook under the library to where Maleficent is in monster form. She's kind of like a zombie. It's literally not important, but basically Hook has to fight Maleficent to get this um, self-destruct while Regina gets the self-destruct like trigger that is under the library in the same place where Emma fought the dragon last season. But Regina betrays Hook and pushes him off a cliff. We don't know. Anyway, she takes out the self-destruct button, which is a ruby looking thing. It's like a jewel, a gem, a diamond maybe? Meanwhile, Emma bumps into Tamara and Tamara drops a slip of paper that has all of their names cross-referenced with their fairy tale characters. And she thinks this is suspicious because remember, Emma can tell when someone's lying. She thinks Tamara is lying. She thinks that Tamara is the one that August was trying to warn them about right before he got transformed into Pinocchio. Someone commented saying that the sentences I said in the last video were so like unhinged and weird. And I just have to agree. Like in context, I guess it makes more sense. But if you took this out of context, that's so funny. So nobody really believes that, uh, nobody believes Emma. Ever, everyone's like, you're just jealous because like of Neil, you think you're still in love with Neil. And she's like, I'm not. I think Tamara is up to something. So Henry is the only one who believes her because like low key, he wants his parents to get back together. They break into Tamara's room because as the sheriff, you know, best practices or whatever, 
Neil catches them and he reveals that he helped Tamara make the list because she's tried to adjust to this whole fantasy fairy tale idea. Back in the Enchanted Forest, Snow nurses Regina back to health. Remember, Snow doesn't know who Regina is. Regina asks Snow why she's helping her and Snow's like, well, one time when I was a little girl, this woman saved me from being on a runaway horse. That's it. <laughs> That's why Snow helps people. And Regina's kind of like, oh shit, that's me. They chit chat a little and Regina finds out that Snow is adamant that the evil queen still has good inside of her. And Regina's like, interesting, interesting, interesting. As soon as they're having this conversation, they stumble upon the entire village that Regina had slaughtered at the beginning of the episode. And that is when Snow is immediately like, no, forget everything I said. She is not redeemable in the slightest. She is the evil queen through and through. But Regina's like, what about the horse? What about when she saved you? And Snow's like, I never said it was Regina who saved me on the horse. And that's when Snow realizes it's Regina undercover. Snow has the chance to kill her, but Regina runs and Snow lets her get away. Rumpel changes Regina back to herself and Regina kind of really embraces the title of the evil queen. Back in Storybrooke, Hook survives Maleficent's little attack. Double crosses Regina, leading her right into the hands of Greg and Tamara, who have discovered a way to stop Regina's magic from working via like these cuffs that they put on her. Greg explains that it's not magic, it's science that stops her magic. Meanwhile, Grumpy, Snow, and Charming find the Orchard of Magic Beans has been burned down, presumably by Regina. Season two, episode 21, second star to the right. So remember when Balefire fell through the portal into a new land back in season one. Well, we catch up to Balefire, who falls through the portal after Rumpel lets him go and chooses magic over him. Bay lands in 19th century London, England. Balefire becomes a little orphan boy. Picture Timothy Chalamet if he was a sickly Victorian boy, which he is just smaller and maybe a little bit more hungry. Bay sneaks in to um, this house where a rich family lives, a very rich house, and starts stealing bread. And he gets caught by none other than someone named Wendy Darling of the Darling siblings of Peter Pan. Michael, Wendy, and John, I think. Which one's John and which one's Michael? I don't remember. It's been a while. Back in Storybrooke, Neil stops Lacey and Gold from beating up Dr. Whale. He confronts Gold and he's like, you haven't changed one bit since my childhood. You're still an asshole. Forget anything I said about forgiving you or trying to save your life. Meanwhile, Emma, David, and Snow are searching for the magic beans that Regina stole because she's they're assuming she stole the beans before burning down the orchards, but they can't find her anywhere. Remember, she's been taken by these two. They um, find out someone broke into Regina's office and took the beans and Emma is convinced it was Tamara who took the beans. Meanwhile, Tamara meets up with Greg and Hook, who have kidnapped Regina and like strapped her down to this electroshock torture, very like Princess Bride style. Tamara and Greg monologue to Regina and say that there's a whole team of people wanting to destroy magic. It's not just the two of them. There's a whole movement to destroy magic and they are just kind of two of the, p the players. They're not even up high in the organization. They're just kind of the henchmen almost. Back in London, Wendy, along with John and Michael, hide Balefire in their house. Their parents discover Balefire but decide to take him in so that they are all like siblings and it's so cute or whatever. Wendy tells Bay that her and her brothers have been visited by a shadow at night and the shadow is like a magical thing. It can do tricks. Remember in London, in our world, there's not supposed to be magic and so Bay is like, do not talk to the shadow. Do not interact with the shadow. Magic is awful. He immediately shuts this down. He's like, nothing good comes from magic. Please trust me. He reveals that he comes from a land with magic and nothing good ever comes from anyone doing magic or interacting with it in any way. So he makes them promise not to entertain the shadow again. As usual, the kids don't listen and they are visited by this very scary looking shadow. The shadow takes Wendy to a place called Neverland and Bay thinks they're never going to see Wendy again. Luckily, the shadow brings Wendy back and she reveals tales of her adventures in Neverland. It's a wonderful place during the day, but at night, all of the lost boys that the shadow has kidnapped over the years start to cry and miss their parents and monsters come out. And the only reason the shadow brought her back 
was because she was a girl and the shadow wants Jod and Michael. He wants to kidnap them and take them to Neverland. Back in Storybrooke, David and Gold track down Regina. He gives Snow magical eye drops to find Regina. Don't ask, I'm tired of explaining. <laughs> that will help them find Regina. Lacey overhears this and realizes that magic is real. When Snow takes the eye drops, she feels that the way Regina is being tortured by this electro shock Princess Bride style machine. Um, and luckily, Snow gathers enough information about where Regina is to find her. Neil and Emma team up and go to this freaky hideout. They find David and Snow, and everyone is also looking for Regina. Meanwhile, Regina reveals to Greg that she had killed his father and buried him. And so Greg keeps torturing her for that one. Shocker. Um, luckily, the Charmings save Regina before she dies. And Neil and Emma fight Greg and Tamara, who they realize are working together, have double-crossed them, etc., etc. Tamara, in a fit of self-defense, throws a magic bean and creates a portal that sucks Neil in. And he also gets shot and then falls through the portal. So not only is he falling through a portal, he's actively dying. The portal closes before anyone can follow, and Emma thinks he's lost for good. Before he fell through, Neil made her promise that she won't abandon Henry, saying, don't let him grow up like we did. Don't let him grow up without a parent. Greg and Tamara get away, but remember the jewel-looking thing that self-destructs Storybrooke? They stole it from Regina when they kidnapped her. So now they have it. Don't ask me why they know what it is. They know exactly what it is. I don't know why. Do I look like I know what's going on? No. But just know this is capital B bad for everyone involved. Back in London, Wendy and Bay try and shadow-proof the nursery to protect John and Michael, but the shadow comes anyway and tries to take them away. Bay, who is a boy and can go with the shadow, sacrifices himself in John and Michael's place and gets taken to Neverland. He gets ripped away from the Wendy Darling's family. The shadow takes him to Neverland and we see it. It's a terrifying place, but before the shadow can bring him to land and present him to kind of the bosses of Neverland, he fights his way out and the shadow drops him in the ocean. He is picked up by a pirate ship manned by none other than Captain Hook. Do you remember how they knew each other? Well, this is how. Last episode, who's excited? Season two, episode 22, and straight on till morning. Ooh. Enter Neverland. We are on Hook's ship. Hook is looking at an old drawing of Mila because he misses her because Rumpel killed her. We know that Hook wants to kill Rumpelstiltskin, but they have a more pressing issue. Everyone thinks that Balefire is a boy that the shadow stole to bring to him. Him is in italics. We don't know who he is. Smee and Hook think that if they return Bay to him, they could be able to survive Neverland because apparently he runs Neverland and lets them pirate or whatever. When Hook and Smee go to interrogate Bay, it takes all of two seconds for Hook to realize that Balefire is Rumpelstiltskin's son. Now that he has Rumpelstiltskin's son in his hands, he does not want to give Bay to him. So Hook welcomes Bay aboard the ship. In Storybrooke, we see Gold once again, highly contemplating killing Henry on the down low, but he's interrupted by the Charmings, who inform him that Neil fell through a portal and is likely dead. The Charmings need Gold to help them find the self-destruct button, because remember, these two are gonna like set it off or something, but Gold refuses. Meanwhile, Tamara and Greg are following commands from their higher-ups in the Anti-Magic League, and they, along with Hook, are in the dwarf mines trying to figure out how to break the gem. They use a dwarf pickaxe to hit the gem, and it starts glowing as if it's gonna self-destruct. And it also starts making earthquakes. Hook goes to the Charmings because he's like, I don't like this plan, actually. This is actually gonna kill me. This is not in my best interest. Um, and tells them what's going on. David punches him in the face, but... Hook explains what's going on, and they go to stop the gem. They form a plan to steal back the beans and bring everyone back to the Enchanted Forest before Storybrooke can be destroyed. Back in Neverland, the clan of Lost Boys, led by a Jamie Campbell Bower lookalike, are looking for Balefire, so the Lost Boys work for whoever he is. We get the idea that the Lost Boys have a lot of power in Neverland. They don't find Bay because Bay is good at hiding aboard the ship, and Hook takes in Bay as a ward and teaches him the ins and outs of sailing a ship. Remember, he learned how to or he knew how to sail the Jolly Roger. Bay reveals to Hook that Rumpel draws his power from a dagger, and this is good for him to know. They also bond over being both abandoned by their fathers. And back in Storybrooke, Mother Superior figures out how to keep people's memories 
when you cross the town line. You have to take a potion and you can get your memories back. So remember the dwarf that lost his memories in episode one? He takes the potion, gets him back. Unfortunately, it's a little too late because the town's about to be destroyed, but at least Gold now has a potion to give Belle her memories back. But now he has to choose, does he want Belle or does he want Lacey? Because you can pick and choose which parts of her to love, apparently. But you know what? He chooses Belle. He gives Belle the potion and she returns as her normal self. Hook and David go after Greg and Tamara and manage to snag one bean. Meanwhile, Regina and Emma go after the glowing diamond. Regina thinks she has to sacrifice herself to stop the diamond and save Storybrooke. But instead, they come up with a plan to send the gem through a portal using the bean so that it doesn't kill Storybrooke and Regina won't have to die. And aside, Hook realizes that Neil is Balefire, his adoptive son person that he took a liking to. During this conversation, I'm trying to remember, <laughs> my notes aren't that great here, Hook kind of uses that as a distraction to steal the last bean so that they can't send the gem through the bean. So they can't use the bean to save Regina's life. Back in Neverland, Balefire finds the drawing of his mother and he realizes that Hook is the pirate because Rumpel told everyone that Hook killed Mila. And so he's like, you're the pirate that killed my mother. And Hook is like, no, your father is the one that killed your mother after your mother came willingly with me. The same lie he told Belle, he told Balefire. Bay still blames Hook for tearing apart his family and he demands to be let off the ship even though Hook offers him a home and a family aboard the ship, just like Mila wanted to. Mila's biggest regret, Hook reveals, is leaving Balefire, but Balefire is still mad at everyone and so he leaves. Or he tries to, because then Bay calls up the Lost Boys and is like, well, this guy doesn't want to be with, any with me anymore, so you can take Balefire to him. You can have him. And so he gives up Bay to appease the Lost Boys. Back in Storybrooke, the town is falling apart. There are earthquakes. It's the end of times. And Emma suddenly remembers she has magic. Thank God, it's about time. And together, her and Regina stop the diamond from exploding. As if that wasn't the obvious move, but it's clear that we're not always genre aware here. Surprise, it works. Super easy, and Storybrooke stops getting self-destructed. But when the dust clears, Henry is gone. He's been taken by Greg and Tamara, and Greg throws another bean, opens another portal, and Greg and Tamara jump in with Henry, and they all disappear. Gold and Belle overhear this, and Gold promises to help get Henry back, because remember, they're family now. Hook feels bad for what he did to Balefire all those years ago, giving Balefire up to him or the Lost Boys. So kind of to rectify that, he gives the heroes the last magic bean so that they can go after Henry. He also offers his ship and services to follow Henry, and Gold is like, fine, I'll enter my collab era with Hook because he has that magic globe that can also track Henry. Meanwhile, Neil, remember he fell through a portal. Neil as an adult, not Balefire. Adult Neil washes up on a beach and he is found by none other than Aurora, Philip, and Mulan. So he has made his way back to the Enchanted Forest presently with our little crew over here who we haven't seen for a while. Back in Neverland, the Lost Boys reveal that Balefire is not the one he wants. He's not the right little boy. Which means that Bay merely gets to be kidnapped and not killed. Awesome. The Lost Boys have a drawing of who he wants. And who is the drawing of? A picture of Henry. Remember, this is Henry's father's childhood. So somehow before Henry is even born, they have a picture of him and want to bring Henry to their leader. Who wants to capture Henry so badly? None other than a man named Peter Pan. What does that mean? Back in Storybrooke, with Hook's ship and Rumpelstiltskin's help, our heroes form an unlikely alliance that sets the stage for the next adventure, one that takes them on the Jolly Roger, second star to the right and straight on till morning, to a place where you never grow up, a place called Neverland. And that is the end of season two. I hope you enjoyed this video. Season three is probably my favorite of the later seasons. So I would love to do season three. Please let me know if you want me to do it. I really hope you enjoyed it. So many new characters, so many new threads. And if you've seen the show, you know exactly 
how much more wild this is gonna get next season. So, um, but until then, I will see you guys in my next video, which may just take a second start of the right and straight on till morning. <laughs> Bye. Hi everyone, really quick before I go, I want to say thank you again for watching the video. Um, and I know that this video took a bit longer than I had originally sort of promised or planned for um, due to a couple personal things, some work things, and of course the fact that I am a full-time student. However, if you want to see season three, I am super hyped to do it. Um, just know that it might take a hot minute. Um, I'm not a full-time YouTuber. I'm, I'm just a girl, but I am a girl very excited about um, the fact that you guys are excited and excited about watching and analyzing and diving into Once Upon a Time. So just know that in your heart, it might take a little while, but I am more than happy and more than excited to do season three. All right, I will see you guys soon. And in the meantime, if you want to follow me on Instagram, you can. You don't have to though, by the way. All right, I'll let you guys go. Bye. <laughs>